Hey guys, uh, my name's Matt and uh, Matthew's. Oh, fucking hell. Who cares? It'll just be Matt. <laughs> hey everyone, my name's Matt and uh, today will be the very first episode for uh, a new platform I'm, I'm hoping to sort of make happen uh, regularly called Grade My Shit, uh, which is basically me. I'm a cinematographer and a colorist and um, just a crazy man and I swear a lot, hence the term shit at the end of Grade My Shit, which has nothing to do with the quality of people's work, just for the record. Um, and during Grade My Shit, uh, I, I want you to meet and interact with other filmmakers from around the world and it's just going to be better than a tutorial because you know I've been making tutorials in the past and people have responded to them with um, a lot of positive feedback which is good but yeah I just wanted to change it, mix it up a little bit and um, for the first time putting myself on camera which is a, a horrifying thing. Um, anyway, so, grade my shit if you haven't heard of it or, or you want to learn more about it, this is episode one, go to mattscottvisuals.com and um, you can see here, Grade My Shit. And Grade My Shit basically is just a new platform that I'm launching that is kind of like a tutorial, like I just said. Let's go ahead and meet our uh, very first guest on Grade My Shit. Uh, this is Devin Edwards. Devin, how are you going? Hey, what's going on? <laughs> I'm chilling. Um, Matt, I'm um, stuttering and, and quite nervous about this, but I think I think it's going to be a good show, and I really appreciate, appreciate you coming on. Um, so, Devin, I guess what... Uh, I'd like to sort of learn about you if I was watching this show is like who are you and and how did you get into cinematography filmmaking and where do you live so yeah cool uh yeah no thanks for having me on the show man um so uh I'm from Dallas Texas um and I'm a creative director so um you know kind of like how I got there was just you know I went I went to uh the University of North Texas and did a film uh, got a film degree there as well as uh, marketing, um, and so just start you know picked up a camera you know um, and started to just edit and shoot stuff and you know just kind of did the whole uh, working my way up and jumping on commercial sets, uh, networking with other directors and whatnot and so um, but anyways um, uh, I feel like I've been in almost every department I've worked on a lot of different you know I creative direct for you know production uh, design you know like um, you know photo uh, photography shoots and all that stuff so um, yeah so I've kind of been in you know every creative endeavor I think that you could be in uh, you know right now uh, I got a long way to go um, but uh, but yeah so nice that's nice so you um did you, when you sort of first sort of ventured into the world of filmmaking, and, and obviously you've had some experience in all these different departments, and you've decided that, you know, a creative director is what you want to do, is that because um, you didn't like other departments as much, or, or so what sort of told you, like, because I find it hard to label myself, like, what am I? Am I a cinematographer? Am I a colorist? Am I a filmmaker? Um, so what, like, what sort of excites you most about filmmaking? I think... Um well, I started in short films, obviously, uh, it was, you know, when you go to kind of like the film school, that's what a lot of people, um, you know, they, they kind of do short films that kind of cut their teeth on and whatnot. So I did the whole indie film, you know, I produced the feature and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. so I, I definitely love the film side of things. And then I'm, um, I think, you know, I was like, Oh, I want to direct, I want to shoot kind of a, you know, I still kind of was unwary of what, but I like, um, the creative director, uh, bit came from me branching into like the agencies uh kind of doing more commercial work and stuff like that kind of getting going you know going more corporate you know versus yeah. like just doing straight uh independent so because creative directors are more you know just director itself is more probably more of a term you know that you would use for film and stuff so that's why i went uh, for more creative director because it just yeah. it doesn't mean i mean i would still you know i would still love to do you know, short films and stuff like that. And I even try to like, when I'm working with clients, I try to, you know, even push them to do like a brand, like a short brand film or something, even if it's like, you know, three minutes or just something that'll, you know, kind of push their brand or whatever in it. So I still love yeah. film. Um, but it's, you know, I think that's where the creative director thing come from. And I just enjoy, um, like I enjoy telling stories, you know, and I feel like as a creative director, you know, you, you kind of, you're pushing a vision and, um, you know, you learn real quick that decision making is what you need to kind of get good at. And in order to do that, you know, I kind of had to be in almost every department, you know, I, I've literally been in every role, you know, and obviously other roles like DP or like a camera op or whatever, I've spent more time versus a lot of other ones, um, you know, but I've been in, you know, production, uh, you know, design or art, art department, you know, I've done some grip and gaff work, 
you know, and you, you know, just as well as I have, you know, you've been on plenty of those shoots where you're wearing multiple hats. You are the DP and the gaffer or something or, yeah. you know, uh, whatever. <laughs> so um, you learn a lot quicker in those uh, situations. And you learn also like you learn you, you, you learn to respect people's roles and whatnot, you know, like, at, you know, yeah. on the times on the times that, you know, you would like DP and gaff. You're like, shit, like, you know, you don't ever want to DP without a gaffer ever again because it just makes things move, you know, move more smoothly, more quick, you know. So, anyways, yeah. So that's that's why creative direction, just because you know storytelling and, and kind of like being able to bring all the parts together, you know, and and yeah. for, for one production. No, it's a it's a good distinction actually, because I mean I've never actually thought about that role, creative director, and it makes more sense that when you're on you know with a small production company trying to create a brand story, is to bring your experience of filmmaking into advertising and marketing. And um, you need to do that in a creative way, right? So creative direct exactly. is perfect. <laughs> exactly. And, um, you know, with your background in cinematography, you, you, you've got the eye. So, like, yeah, I like it. All right. Well, um, uh, so you've contacted me through uh, Grade My Shit. So thank you for doing that. And um, yeah. we're very lucky to actually have an awesome job to work on um, this episode, which is for a brand. Um, help me out with the brand. It was uh, uh, a, Jack, watch, it was, a watch company. Yeah. Watch brand, yeah, Jack Mason brand. They're uh, they're they're fairly new. They're only about nine, I think nine or ten months old, and it's um, it's a split of just entrepreneurial people and some people from Fossil uh, corporate headquarters, kind of formed, um, you know, or you know, and various other watch com- basically a bunch of people from a bunch of different like watch companies, kind of like formed together to make their own thing, you know, kind of an entrepreneurial venture and uh, local awesome. here to Dallas, and so um, yeah. And that was under the uh, the production company Terse Branding, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a branding agency or a creative agency, agency here here in Dallas, and uh, you know, and so uh, they reached out, hit me up, and wanted a creative director on this, and so, and I'm I'm you know, I know uh, some of the people that work there, friends with some of the people that work there, so they hit me up. Nice. Well, let's go ahead and have a look at the piece. So uh, cool. when Devin contacted me, sent me through the link. And, um, and, you know, just, just sort of a heads up with Grade My Shit. It does, don't feel pressured to, like, send me your best work or, or feel pressured that it has to be shot on a red or anything like that, just for any viewers out there who um, are looking to have their work featured or be on the show. Um, I, I literally want a range. I want a, uh, something shot on an iPhone. I want something shot, you know, on an Ari Alexa. I don't care what it is. The point is I want to talk to real people and making real things, and I want a challenge. <laughs> Um, but what is cool about this particular piece for me is like it, it's going to bring up an interesting topic that I'd like to talk about when it comes to color grading uh, and cinematography and how these two worlds uh, collide because um, for, with what I do, the majority of what I do is I do both. I often get to color grade whatever I shoot. And, and what I've learned about that is that, uh, you know, without trying to blow my own trumpet or anything, if it's shot well... <laughs> You can grade it well, uh, and 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 I guess the topic that I wanted to talk about was like this is shot well, this is shot really well, um, and and I just wanted to talk about that as well. Like, what does it mean by shot well? Well, obviously it needs to look good, but I think the lighting is really important to be shot well. Um, the camera movement and composition choice and things like that is obviously important, but also the location, um, what you chose to include in the frame, the color palettes that are in the frame. And what's really working working for this piece, um, you have some really strong points. Lighting is one of them. Location is another. And just color palette in general, like um, which I'm going to talk about when we start grading it. But yeah, so when you sent this through, instantly I was just like, holy shit, like this looks fucking awesome. And I actually, Appreciate you that. know, yeah, man. Like when I saw a few of these shots, I'm like, oh, can't wait to work on this one. Can't wait to, <laughs> you know, bring out something on this one. And I'm like, another couple of shots, I'm just like, Oh, I'd probably uh, back that off a little bit, or you know. Uh-huh. But the point is, it it got the the creative juices flowing, and um, yeah, I think it's going to be a great first piece to showcase uh, some of your work and some of my work, and what it sort of means to have a collaboration between a creative director and a colorist, or a cinematographer and a colorist. So, um, we'll talk more about how the production went and what your involvement was and and you know some more finer details about the location lighting etc um because we've got some great stills that you've provided which is um awesome some behind the scenes stuff so we get to see that which is really cool but um let's just play the piece and have a look and see what we'll be working with cool 
We are inspired by the Texas spirit and fueled by collaboration. Surrounding ourselves with a community of creatives, explorers, leaders, experts in the field. We bridge that divide. The divide between thoughtful design and attainable goods. Late nights and early mornings, driven by passion and never complacent, that is what makes us tick. We are focused on quality. We are focused on our craft. We are Jack Mason. Yeah, so that's the piece. Um, some awesome stuff to work with here. And uh, this was shot on our red camera, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, it was the red scarlet uh, W. So um, on uh, Canon uh, L series lenses. Sweet. So the red scarlet W. And I think you said it was shot. A lot of it was in 60p. It was all 60p. It was all 60p. Yeah, just because I wasn't sure. You know, kind of. You know, uh, I didn't really know the vibe that I wanted. I don't know if I wanted it to kind of like all be slow mo, or if I wanted to interchange from you know sixty frames to twenty four frames. Um, so I just went ahead and shot it all sixty, which you know did limit us because we only we were very limited on uh, storage on cards, space not storage, but uh, you know uh, camera cards. Okay, yeah, because the sixty p is a hell of a lot more frames. What is that? Triple the data rate, something yeah, like that. Exactly. Yep. So uh, not that gear is, you know, important and I don't want to get caught up about, you know, how awesome cameras are and lighting and equipment like that because, you know, I like to promote the idea that you can shoot amazing work with not amazing cameras. Um, but in any case, you uh, looks like you had a red on this shoot and some, some pretty cool lighting. Uh, do you want to just talk a little bit about the camera and lighting package that you used? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so... Um I uh, I opted to get the the red scarlet W just but just honestly because of price point I wanted to I honestly wanted to shoot on an Alexa just because I really like uh, the skin tones especially from like an Alexa Mini because it's the price point and you get the skin tones yeah. um, but they, their budget wasn't quite there so I rolled with the red scarlet W hit the price point on that um, uh, just because I wanted the resolution and you know obviously red still got a good look um, and um, so we went with that, and then we went with um, uh, Canon L series lenses, just to once again, you know, save uh, a little bit of money. And, and you know, you know, uh, lenses aren't you know that super duper important. Um, but uh, you know, I, I know I wanted to shoot this thing pretty shallow. So, um, yeah. so so th that's where we went with on that. When it comes to the lighting, um, we got an Airy twelve hundred HMI because. Uh, um, I just wanted to make sure that I had a, a pretty powerful source, um, but nothing too overbearing. And I think the 1200 was good because it's nice, and you know you can get a nice, uh, a big spread from it and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, we got a Joker 800, uh, which is you know still pretty, pretty powerful, um, but it's a nice. Shit. Yeah, it's just a That's nice. A joke, I just yeah. loved it. Oh, sorry, I don't have your thing pulled up. Uh, one second, I'm so sorry. Uh, oh no, that's yeah, fine. yeah, yeah. That's the Joker 800 right there that we're looking at, um, and that's Rob. That's uh, that's our gaffer. He's a really cool, dude. Knows his shit. Um, nice. And so, let me pull this gear list back up. So, um, and then and then we also had, um, we had a 1K tungsten, Airy, and uh, two 250 watt Lowell's or Lowell. Uh, like um Fresnels and those were just good for like hair lights um the tungsten was there just for like if we wanted to do you know some uh you know like warehouse like like you know warehouse look whereas the HMIs were going to be great to uh, actually get really good skin tones to match a lot of we had a lot of daylight coming in from the from a lot of the, a lot of the windows that were yeah. in this place and yeah, so since there was a lot of win yeah exactly since there's a lot of windows you know I just you know you know, and, and CT, CTP is good, you know, to, to, like, color match and stuff. But the HMIs just give amazing, uh, you know, just uh, natural skin tones, especially if you're shooting in daylight. It just helps. It's almost just like the sunlight itself. So, yeah. um, um, uh, so oh, yeah. And then, and then so just to cover real quick some of the grip gear, just, you know, we had I wanted to make sure that we had some 4x4 um, four four floppies. And because... Those are really great for adding depth. I mean, even if you're just, you know, you set the lighting how you want on the subject and you just bring one of those in on a C stand. Um, you can see that we were using some of the floppies on the watch shot when she's reaching into the case. There's right there on the left side of me. 
Um, uh, you just had it. You just had it. Uh, there, that's a fo- that's a floppy. But there you go. Yeah. So you can see how we're kind of like just cutting some of that um, light just to add some shape because in that initial shot, um, she just was a little too. She was. It looked too um, lit. You know, like I mean, like you could tell that there's perfectly lit with uh, lights around her. And so I brought in, or I had the gaffer bring in a uh, the four by four floppy just to add that 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 texture there that shadow you know kind of like wrapping around her face just to add just a little bit more depth to the shot um so for i I really like four by four floppies because you can literally go into a place like you know uh we shot at a gas station once and we really couldn't bring in lights because it was a live gas station and and so we had to use the overhead lights that were already in there and so you know brought in a four by we just literally moved the four by four floppy around and positioned it as such just to add depth so um, I think those helped a lot on this whole shoot because everywhere that we went, even without lights, there was just a ton of light coming in from the windows because mm. we were shooting, you know, all the, I mean, we shot all the way from morning to, to nighttime. So we had light in there at all times, basically. Um, but awesome. yeah, and then, you know, and then just randomly assorted, you know, shit, your typical grip, you know, like C, a ton of C stands. And I wish, I think going forward, I'll get a uh, grip truck for next time just because it was, um, it was a clusterfuck in there. Uh, you you could see on some of the shots. There's like a a shot where we were doing the top down shot, um, and the B- BTS picture, uh, and you can just see the shit everywhere. Uh, yeah, something like oh, that. Yeah. Go to the go to the other one. Yeah, yeah. Go to the other one where it's yeah that one. You can just see. Sh- I mean, there's just shit everywhere. I mean, and there was more stuff behind it. And we basically took over their office. That's their headquarters office. And yeah, um, yeah. So. Awesome, man. Limited, no, that's really, for sure. It's so good to see behind the scenes stuff because what I really like about this piece, is, uh, like especially these hero shots like this, <laughs> is that it doesn't look lit. Like it just looks like, oh, didn't they luck out that day as she was leaning into the cabinet? <laughs> but like it doesn't look like, oh, yeah, I see where you put that HMI. And I noticed that you cut the light with the floppy and you got a bit of a tungsten kicker back here, but mm-hmm. it just doesn't look like that. So you know, props to you gaffer and yourself for, you know, keeping an eye on that sort of thing. I mean, this looks a little bit more lit, but still it has like a naturalistic look to it. Um, right. So really nice work. Really nice work. That's, that's something I really struggle with is um, I, I'm good at making something look stylistic, but um, there's a couple of directors I work with. <laughs> I won't mention their names. And they're kind of like, oh, you know, next time we work together, I was thinking maybe we try and, you know, use less lights and, and not really light at all or make it not look lit and it's like that's the hardest thing in the world to do <laughs> yeah. yes i'll try i'll try yeah it's, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> it's to put a light somewhere make it useful but don't make it look like that you lit it like and yeah I think you guys have really pulled that off so yeah nice work and we can see behind the scenes for this shot as well i think yeah we so i I, I supplied it. a couple of different photos so basically there's the there's a shot and to your right of the screen there You've got a you've got the airy 1K. Um, oh, this guy. That's yeah, yeah. what. Yep, but exactly, which is pointing towards him, and we, you know, you can clearly see the CTB there gelling it. Yeah. Um, uh, I think we ended up, you know, obviously, powers of light, and we had the Joker behind it. So, um, you know, we had to uh, we had to use the 1K. You know, as much as I would love to use um, an HMI in that shot, I just didn't have a mm. low wattage HMI. Um, so we had to, you know, utilize just what we had basically. So, mm. uh, utilize nice. the one K there. Awesome. And then you, you're cutting out some ambient light over here, which is important. Yeah. It was well. just a little too much. It was just a little too much, you know? And, and, um, and yeah, and then we just dollied in there with, uh, the Dana. Yeah. Should we quickly talk about that as well? Um, mm-hmm. just having a dolly and I noticed that like a lot of the shots, there's basically movement in every shot as, as subtle as it might be. Like even that shot, for for example. Yep. So subtle, but really nice. And that was done on the Dana. Uh, that shot that you're that so actually those two shots right there where it's in the case um, is the only shots in the whole thing that was not done on a Dana dolly. Um, that was actually just me monopoding some shitty tripod and just uh, literally holding it against my chest and just kind of Whoa. you know. Just walking in, and I just um, I just slightly stabilized the shots in After Effects, and 
imported them back into Premiere. So, Shit, um, and I think awesome. there might there might there might be just a touch of digital zoom, like so much just to give it a like. It was a yeah. mixture of like just a little push of digital zoom with me kind of like. So it was a bitch because I was on the uh, I think a hundred mil on that one, and so it would like Whoa. go out of focus if I just you know flinched. So, and that's the hundred <laughs> mil Canon L. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. thing is a fucking yeah. nightmare. <laughs> it's sharp, but oh, what a horrible lens to work with. Yeah, wow. man, it it was it was rough. It was rough. But yeah, some some really nice stuff there. And then, uh, just because I've personally never used that dolly, and I've always wanted to, it just looks so. It looks like the right size to work with. Nothing too bulky, and the fact that we can lift it off the ground and and seemingly easily position it. I mean, how was it to work with? Oh, it it was great on this one because honestly, if I could choose, obviously I want a Fisher. Every every time I want a Fisher because mm. they're just. I mean, they're just so smooth. I mean, you can't, you know, it's like, yeah, you can add stabilize all day, but it's just, there's just something like this raw, especially filmmaking narrative feel that you get from using a Fisher, you know, like a legit uh, dolly on like a track and stuff. But mm. for something like this, I literally had, you know, I, we, we had, I think 15, no, we had like 12 or so, like 13 setups, basically, you know, and like there's some shots in here, basically, that you're not seeing that's a part of, um, you know, another cut or we just didn't use it all together. There's literally some sh some setup shots, like someone pouring coffee and stuff that we just didn't even use. And we spent, you know, an hour trying to get that shot. So we, we, yeah. we were moving around a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And I needed something mobile. And if you have a Fisher dolly, you're you're kind of there. I mean, you know, like you, you know, you. It, yeah, you can move it, but it just it takes too long. And so this thing was big budget point. They basically had, you know, like I they just didn't have a big budget at all, but they mm -hmm. had a good product, a good story, a great location. Um, and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to pull my resources on this one and, and make it work. So I own the Dana Dahlia um, and uh, I bought one a while back just because I thought they were pretty affordable and you can just move around. So I think that they save a lot of time. Yeah, they're not the most you know but if you're shooting on <coughs> you know 60 frames and you're keeping your movements pretty subtle you can make it seem pretty you know it can work you know yeah i think it d definitely worked for this piece i mean again it's it's at that balance between creating something that looks really good but without you noticing what you did so like along with the lighting like the camera movement it's subtle enough to be just to be working and and acting the way it should like here you know, our focus starts with the guy playing the guitar, and then by exactly. the end of the shot, um, not only composition and, and blocking, she pulls her phone out as well, which attracts our attention, but the camera mm -hmm. movement is just ever so, ever so slightly just tracking from right to left. Yeah, I just wanted yeah. some movement because the piece was supposed to move, you know, like, and... and and but I didn't want it to be obnoxious, you know. I know you've seen those mm. pieces where people use straight Ronin on the whole piece, or or, or a or a movie, or so, or you know, in, in every single shot. And mm. you know that's just obnoxious, um, uncalculated movement to me. And so I just wanted to make sure that if there is going to be movement in almost every shot, I just I don't want it to be obnoxious. I want it to be mm. subtle. And on the ones that it needs to move, like the, you know, where we're um, dollying in. Or I guess that'd be like a truck or trucking in to the uh, uh, like the watch on the wall. Like that one's a little bit more, oh, yeah, you yeah. know, like that one's a little bit more. Okay, we're like we're pushing into this thing, you know. So, mm. um, but uh, to um, to finish out on the on the on the dolly, I think that uh, you know we we had four feet and eight feet rails and. I think the the biggest thing to get from that was that we it it was more of a time saving option you know than anything yep. I, I think that's what it was because initially I was going to just throw it throw this camera on a Ronin and just walk yep. and I wasn't gonna you know I wasn't going to like push the Ronin in every shot but maybe you just like sit there like this on some of them you know yep. just to save time but man you still get the you know yeah, the bob, the bobbing. You see, yeah, it's really hard. So I've done yeah. that before. <laughs> thus, thus and why we so went tempting, with that choice. Right? Yeah, it yeah. is. It is. All right, cool. Well, um, and lastly, I just wanted to, you know, before we start getting into the color and talking about the color grading, the direction and what you've already done with it and things like that, it's just the location. I mean, 
you, you, do you ever get a client where they're like, you know, we want to push this, we want our brand to be sexy, and you know, we don't want to jam any people's faces, but we want it to be subtle and attractive. And then, like, all of a sudden, you end up in some warehouse that just looks fucked, and there's like some green lights, some orange lights, and no, yep. <laughs> like, it's just a horrible, horrible place. Where here, I, yeah. I feel like you lucked out, man. I'm, I'm, I'm saying you, you worked with the place well, but. Yeah. No, a good. lot of the I'm I'm not going to lie. A lot of the shots cuz initially I went in there with my 6D full frame DSLR and was just kind of just doing test shots. You know, this is after we've made the agreement and I've got a couple of weeks to kind of put the you know, the piece together. And yeah. so I automatically knew, okay, like 50% of the work is kind of already almost done for us. It's not like we're in a pitch dark studio like like most of the work a lot of the hard work is already done. Like we've already got a lot of our key light and stuff like that already there and a lot of these shots. And so now that's what, that was the first conversation I had with my gaffer. It was like, look, man, let's not overthink this. Let's get, you know, the lights that we need and literally just like, just compensate for what's already there. You know, like uh, um, make better just by a touch of what's already there kind of a thing. And, And maybe like use, use the floppies to cut and add shadows and add depth and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons why, uh, this piece looks the way it does because I went up and beyond what I, I mean, honestly, the budget range, you know, that they're in it, it you know, I should have showed up with my DSLR camera and, you know, uh, a PA and, you know, and, and maybe like a, a, gr- a grip or something, you know, I mean, just being realistic. And so, hmm. um, but since I saw the location, they have an awesome story. They're re- they're literally the coolest people ever. I mean, just really <laughs> fun to work with and collaborate. Um, they awesome. brought their they brought their input to the table, but made it where, you know, like the vision that I had for their the reason that they're hiring me. They still kind of left that intact. You know, they didn't trample over. They didn't hire me and then tell me what to do. You know, Ugh. where where well, a lot of clients like to do that. There's a message out there for like clients don't be fucking assholes right like (laughs) so many times that happens where like you've got a group of people who who want you to create something and they hire you to do the job and then they start walking over it and changing things last minute and you know know. like we're hiring they're hiring us for a reason so you know put some trust in us and and we'll do an amazing job and i think you've definitely pulled it off with a great team here precisely yeah and so that that's that's why i went with them and went i kind of doubled down on the production you know and and pulled strings on certain equipment and whatnot and so but yeah the location was amazing i just that mm. that's definitely not the case for a lot of other clients i mean you have to go find that location or you have to kind of work with what you have kind of like how you're talking about with the shitty warehouse with the green light and you know uh fluorescence and whatnot and so i I just think i lucked out on this one why it's why i doubled down you know i saw the opportunity that there was going to be a lot of things already kind of in place and i just put the you know i just put the pieces you know uh put put them together hey i noticed something um and i don't know if this is the final cut (laughs) but um in this particular shot here (laughs) it looks like we have a camera operator or uh, someone back here (laughs) What's going you know, on it's there? funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> that's funny. So only you're gonna probably catch that because no one else is going to actually like look at uh you know every you know there there no one else is like gonna color it or look at it like this. So I'll I'll let this one slide. But actually, uh, if you you might even have it. I don't know, but because uh, I added some handles on the footage I sent you. But oh, yeah. like like oh, you can see him run back. <laughs> one or two seconds his that guy's arm is around the the you could see his arm sticking out of that doorway and he's hitting the door uh but to call the dog that's actually the dog ah nice and (laughs) so i didn't even see it till after the like i had the footage in the edit and i was like damn it i was like ah this dude's arms just like flailing in the background he's just like (laughs) slapping slapping the floor and it just looks so stupid and so because I actually wanted to cut in just a second or two before this, but I can't because his arm's in there. But, um, you know, obviously, so now looking at this so that you point that out, you know, obviously a, a request that I would that I would want, if possible, as a director would be like, hey, man, are we able to do like a power window there and like black that or, you know, kind of add some shadow to get rid of his it's done. You know, arm or... It, I've already done it. <laughs> <laughs> I've nice. already well, done it. That's cool. And, cool catch. and if the guy's hand was hanging out, we could have fixed that as well. So Yeah, right, right. 
So I, I will be showing you um, sort of what I did for that as well. And, and just Beautiful. for the viewers, what we're looking at here is um, not what I've color graded. So I ha haven't touched this yet. So this is sort of like um, a gray. Light, light color, light color. Yeah, yeah, it's been done and it's been done well. It's tastefully done, um, but it's definitely not my style or how I would grade it. Um, and that's what we're it's gonna not see done by. It, yeah, it's not done by a professional, uh, you know, a colorist. Oh, I mean, but it's like still I, I don't at a professional yeah. level. There's nothing really I, to pick on. It's just you know. Appreciate that. Thanks. But except that guy that I can see. <laughs> except that guy. He he really shitted up the shot. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. It's one of those things where you realize after the fact, and you're like, well, not a lot I can do. Um, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, man. Well, um, I guess before I sort of jump into this and start grading it and talk about my um, procedures and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I'll just cover a few things with you now. And, and one of them is that, you know, when, whenever I talk to a client about grading a project, um, especially one that I didn't shoot, you always have to be careful that I don't go in a direction that's completely wrong, obviously. Um, it might right. sound obvious, but there'll be times where a client's just like, here, here's the job, do what you want. And then the, the risk with that is like, what if the DP deliberately shot um, this tungsten area like this, for example, you know what I mean? Like he right. he, he warmed the camera and he or she, and, and they decided that like, that's actually how we want this. And then, you know, it gets to the colorist and the colorist is like, whoa, they fucked the white balance up on that one. Ah, oh, it's fixed now. <laughs> so right, right. that's technically the wrong thing to do. So I guess um, part of the communication that I want to have with you is um, sort of what direction are you hoping that I'll take, take the... Um, the commercial in and is there any sort of okay. stylistic choices that you're looking for or is it more just a balance or so yeah, it, yeah. so okay so and I'll, I'll start i'll answer your question by starting my thought process real quick on on the initial project so whenever we you know whenever i got the call for this project and i took a look at the client and started you know working with them and talking about you know i started talking about who they wanted to be and you know their you know how you know where they wanted to kind of uh, be situated visually and um, yep. compared to compared to other brands and so um, my first thought was like okay I want to shoot this thing and I want to make it authentic as possible um, I want to I don't want to overpower anything um, because they're as a company they still are trying to figure out kind of who they are and what they stand for but I just think that yeah, yeah. I just think that um, just by looking at their products, it's like this classic, you know, very, um, you know, simplistic, min minimalistic uh, products. And so I didn't want to go too overboard with anything. And that, that relates to the lighting. I didn't want to, you know, overstage or over stylize too many of the too many of the lighting setups. Um, uh, I didn't want to go too overpowering with like, oh, I want to do like a teal, uh, you know, a ridiculous like teal and orange you know, I just kind of wanted this very natural, authentic look um, for for the piece, and just didn't want to overdo anything. I think that was my initial direction of the whole piece. Um, you know, and also why I kept a lot of the shots very short and concise, and you know, one mm. movement. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm sketching, and it, you know, I'm just putting this hat in the box. You know, it's nothing. We don't stay on too, we don't stay on anyone for too long, basically, because we're just yeah. wanting to see these these little vignettes. So these little vignettes of these characters, right? And I didn't really want all, I didn't want all of the lighting and environments to kind of mesh together. Uh, you know, I kind of wanted them to actually be, you know, different setups, even though most of the shots were done in the same environment. So that yeah. was also the hard part from, you know, me and the gaffer's point of view was like, okay, we've kind of kind of like add more shadows here to switch it up from the last shot. You know, I don't want it. I just ah, didn't yeah. want it to feel like the same, like we're shooting in the same area. And I think that we, we, I think we achieved that because each shot, mm. but, 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 you know, I wanted to be different s setups, different environments, but I, but yes, I still wanted everything to somewhat flow of this is the same brand. Right. You know, so, um, kind of keeping the, the, and I think that's where the Dana Dolly helped. And because yeah. it added this consistency, right? So, so yes, there are different environments. There, it, there's these little character vignettes, but they're all kind of strung together with the sa same movements, the same kind yeah. of even like e framing, right, and whatnot. And so, I think that was the the overall direction of the whole piece. Not nothing too much, you know. Yep. 
Yeah, okay, so, like, along with your composition, camera movement, and and things like that, you have, you know, est established that, I think, that even though it is, is all in the same building, like, we've got this watch cabinet here, and mm -hmm. these sort of, these luxurious-looking shots, and then we're sort of here, which is in the same building, but it, it looks like that this could be in a different building, or... Right. So you've already achieved that, I think, with contrast, and, and you know, look at this huge drop off of light on the right hand side here mm -hmm. so I guess what uh, my goal usually is to do is to make sure that um, exposure wise in terms of highlights and shadows like that everything matches um, so would you be okay with that so for example like I've had clients yep. who want this <laughs> um, so there's no blacks basically gotcha yeah um, and so I think so what need, I yeah. wouldn't do I wouldn't do that combined with something like that right gotcha um, so I, I will always try and match the contrast but i'm not going to change the lighting so much i'm going to try not to um, yeah i just think that the most of the shots are pretty moody i think that was the best mm. that was the term that kept being thrown around on set because yeah they're just you know they've nothing is kind of you know even like this guy you know he's got a nice mm. curve shadow curve going on um so I definitely like it being somewhat contrasty, but nothing too ridiculous. I mean, you know, yeah. I wouldn't mind a little, a little, you know, fade in the in the black, or you know, what I'm saying like we're we're not yeah. crushing the blacks completely. Um, yeah, especially in know. these shadows here. I definitely I yeah. try and bring out a bit more detail in here. Exactly. Um, yeah, you're missing that. a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then um, other things that sort of like that straight away pop into mind are like I mean I really love this shot, and we're gonna fix the the dog trainer owner in the background there um mm -hmm. but a few things that irritate me <laughs> which is so minor so so minor no like I, the blown oh. out background's fine man it's oh, the okay. the green sort of cast that i've got here the reflections from um outside trees maybe i'm not sure what it is or an yep. above light that has fluorescent so i'd probably correct that and balance that blue all the way through and um and maybe try and, and have a bit of balance so we've got the blue jeans we've got the blue on the floor that I would also make this left hand yeah. side here blue as well and that's really going to help balance the shot so when I talk about balance sometimes it's it's literally that where I'm not going to change the lighting contrast ratios but I might fuck with the colors a little bit so would you be okay yeah. with me doing that yeah I'm I'm, re I'm really open on this project this would be a really cool I mean this is this is going to be a good like collaboration on your end because I mean, literally, it's it's kind of an open slate. I just don't think that we just overdo anything, and we're fine. And it yep. sounds like you've already decided that you're not going to overstylize anything. So yeah, no. I mean, also that's a great what you just said is great because their their brand color is like this navy kind of light blue ah. color. Anyways, you should have asked that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's what, okay. Like um, yep, yep. Basically, yeah, yeah. Ah, all right. Well, yeah, that's yeah. good to know, actually. So I wonder. You know, like this highlight on the watch here looks exactly the same as this mm -hmm. blue here. Yeah, so definitely if, blue. Um, blue is the mm. consistent color throughout. I think that's the best accent color to to use. Um, but yeah. that's why you know he's wearing like a blue shirt. You know, and and mm. uh, there's kind of I don't know. I mean, yeah, and and to me like that shot's almost too like the table is like blue, and that yeah, shot, yeah, that yeah. was actually a dark brown table. Yeah. And, uh, I'd probably match it to this. Yeah. Because uh, that's supposed to be him, or it is him, right? So, yeah, yeah. That's, I want those. Those shots aren't really f meshing right now, so that hopefully yeah. you can do something with that. Yeah, for sure. And um, I was thinking as well, because like in every episode, I, I, I want to try and show off, basically. <laughs> got to do it. So you I was thinking, flex. Yeah. <laughs> well, this Jack Mason brand, we could completely change that if you wanted to. <laughs> no, manager. But, um, yeah, so I actually haven't even seen the raw files yet. So these are H.264s that I've chopped up. Um, so uh -huh. it be interest interesting to see what details left in the sky there and sort of how far we can push things like reframing as well. Uh -huh. um, so in a real uh, color grading situation where you're the client, I would go through and do a balance pass and a slight grade. And then I'd also, you know, do outrageous things like, you know, maybe I would reframe this shot mm -hmm. and then I'll, I'll let you know I'll be like oh what do you think you know uh, it's completely different to what you asked so yeah That's maybe funny. I'll like yeah. go through yeah. and have a look at doing things like that as well 
No, and they, um, they, there were certain things, obviously, and you know that for client like this. And I'm just while we're on the shot in this particular shot, they they wanted to just barely catch the airstream. I don't know. It's just yep. even though we're not seeing anything on it, they just want to show that they're tailgating, you know, or not tailgating, but they're, yeah. you know, they're pulling the airstream. The airstream is one of their like big like, you know, it's what sets them apart uh, versus a lot of uh, other companies. Um, yeah, that's why you cool, also actually. see. I yeah. love this shot. Yeah, man, that's that's a really pretty shot. Um, oh, it's so good. And uh, yeah. and like and yeah. like and like the warehouse, you know, like like you were saying, like yeah, I'm trying to like purposely go for like a you know, a tungsten-ish, whatever, like, warehouse. I just want a warehouse vibe and stuff like that. But I don't I don't know if it was really achieved that well on my end. Um, I don't it, know. It's definitely worked lighting-wise. The only thing you, you don't have an establishing, like, a wide shot to say, that now we're in the warehouse. But we don't necessarily yeah. need one. Yeah. Um, so what I could do, I might play with a couple of variations on that one. So I'll leave it tungsten, maybe uh-huh. bring out some detail in the hat. And and then I'll do one balanced as well, and just see how it flows. Because sometimes that's a nice way to just look at it as a piece. Because, totally. I mean, that's the thing with color grading as well. Um, you know, it, it's so easy to grade a shot and put that online and and do a wipe from log film mode to like color graded mode, and people are like, "Wow, sick!" But then it's like, "All right, well, imagine grading this entire film." Oh, oh, that's that's much more difficult. Now these shots have to match. Yeah, that's that's really hard, and like, you know, maybe I'm really happy with the shot because one, it's lit beautifully, framed beautifully, and and you know, this one is not as pretty. So no. how do we get them to match? And this is a challenge of any colorist, um, and that's what I'm going to be facing. But yeah, this would be great content to work with. Um, yeah, all right. Well, I reckon that wraps it up um, cool. until I sort of get to work. <laughs> but right. thanks for you know answering all the questions and sharing a lot of your experiences with the shoot and. It's been really good chatting with you. Cool, man. Well, thanks for having me. It was, uh, I, I think everything's going to go pretty smoothly. All right. Awesome. So I'm going to get to work, but uh, just as we wrap up, uh, Devin is actually being kind enough to allow me to uh, upload one of these clips, sick, to the blog. Um, so you can, if you've ever been, been to my blog before, you'll notice there's a, a download section. Download that shit. Yeah. And usually I just offer like my own content up there because it's like mine, right? or producers and directors that I've worked with who have been nice enough to share it with the community. And I, I want to do that with um, Grade My Shit as well. So I'm going to upload a shot from this project, and you guys will be able to download that, follow along with um, the demonstration slash tutorial. And um, yeah, I just really appreciate you sharing that with the community as well, because it just sort of wraps it up then. Like, you know, we get to learn about you, uh, we get to talk shit, you get to see some grading, and then you actually get to grade it yourself. So thank you so much. <laughs> Oh shit, yeah, grade my shit, <laughs> episode one. I don't have a camera on me this time. I'm just bad at that shit, like I totally fucked up that interview as you could see. Sorry, Devin. Um, it's going to get better, I promise. And they're going to be more on time. I don't promise. <laughs> Here we are. So we're in uh, DaVinci Resolve 14 uh, public beta, and you know you don't need the studio version, although we are going to be doing some noise reduction in this, and I'll be covering a few of that sort of those sort of tips. So do you need it? No. Is it better? Hell yeah. Is it worth it? Fucking earth. 250 bucks. Buy this shit. So good. So how do we, or how would I um, approach this color grading session? So I've just had a brief with Devin and he basically told me that he wants to maybe enhance what's already there um, and just, you know, he's also given me a little bit of free range to do what I want with this project. And that's usually um, the best, the best outcome from a grading meeting. Um, but sometimes it's annoying too. Sometimes you want a client to say, hey, I really want this to be like teal orange. <laughs> Maybe you don't. The point is like sometimes it's nice to have direction and other times it's nice just to go to town. So here we have um, the whole edit that I've just placed together roughly. So it's actually not exactly the same as the one we just watched, the one that Devin cut, um, only because I had to re-piece it together with downloaded clips. Um, anyway, it's basically the same. Uh, clips are the same. I haven't messed with exposure, but one thing that we need to be careful of or one thing that we need to consider is the fact that this is shot raw and we are using these raw clips. So that gives us more choices than usual, um, which can be a good or a bad thing. It's always a good thing having more choices, I think, but it can be a bad thing too because it might slow you down. You might know what you're doing or don't know what you're doing and you could totally fuck it up if you don't know what you're doing. 
So I'm not going to, you know, go through too much detail about all this and, you know, these Grade My Shit episodes. Otherwise, they'll be like three, four hours long. I want to try and keep them around an hour. So if you can be bothered hanging around, maybe you'll learn some things and maybe you'll be able to teach me some things. And, you know, it's scary showing people how you would grade things outside of showing off your best work because this won't be my best work. This will just be me trying to grade something in real time, um, you know, without practice. And, you know, it's scary. So anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at how we're going to decode this red footage. So we're going to go to our master project settings and have a look at the camera raw settings. And we're going to make sure we click on red because this footage is in fact an R3D. It's recorded at 5K and has beautiful 16 bit, um, you know, shit loads of colors, 16.7 million or something more than that, 200 shit load. Anyway, 16 bits fucking mad. Excellent. So how do we debayer this footage? How do we tell Resolve to deal with this footage? Well, there's sort of two, and I'm just going to say two, there's probably 13 different ways we could set this project up, but there's two main ways we could look at this project. One is to look at this project the way our cinematographer was looking at this on the day. Do we look at these clips the way they were recorded, or do we set them up as red log film and work in them in a log format? Now you might be thinking, hey, if you're a professional colorist, of course you're going to be working in log mode, right? Well, no, not, not at all, actually. Um, it's nice to have that option, and in some rescue scenarios, I'll definitely switch to log, and you'll see me do that um, later on in this workflow. And depending on your workflow as well, are we using a LUT? Are we pre-grading sort of grading this in the color management section with a 3D LUT? Or are we managing it using Asus Color or you know DaVinci's um, color manage system? If so, then yes, log format is going to be very useful and important to us. If not, um, and that's the case today, I'm just going to be grading directly from the Rec. 709-ish LUT or, or basic standard uh, look that's built into red cameras. So we just need to cover that quickly. So as you can see, all of these clips are red. And we need to go ahead and click on the settings, go to color uh, camera raw, make sure we set our settings to red. And we just quickly go over this stuff. So decode quality, how good does it look? Full res premium looks the best, but it's choose your computer power. And then you can go down to the crappest. So you can set that here. The bit depth um, isn't going to make a whole bunch of difference unless your actual monitor that you're grading on or looking at, um, if you want to debayer it at the highest possible um, bit depth, then 16 obviously is the best. Time code is not important for this clip, but this little drop down menu is. So we have a bunch of options, right? So how many clips have we got here? 30 clips or whatever. They're all being processed the same way right now. And the way they're being processed is according to this project. Now, by default, when you bring red footage in, it will be set to camera metadata. What that means is that when you click that and press save, and we right click on any one of these and go update all thumbs, then this is how Devon saw it on the day, right? Camera metadata just means the settings that were recorded on the day in camera. So that is how I'm going to process this footage. And you know, if we have a look at the waveform, you can see that there's a decent amount of contrast here. We've got some highs and some lows. You know, things are looking pretty good. Some of the white balance is off and we're gonna play with that and fix that. But the point is that we could actually change this and say, hey, no, don't use the metadata in the camera. Use these settings that I chose. And that's what's cool about RAW, because we can change these things as if we changed them on the day. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail about color science, color space, and gamma curve, but it will couple of, cover a couple of things very quickly. One of them is um, the color space. So the color space is basically um, red giving you the option to debay this footage based on their color science, or their color space, sorry, color science is just here. We don't really need to worry about that. Just make, it on, make sure it's on the newest version. The color science is more important. If we chose something like sRGB, and click save, you'll notice the colors change. It went more orangey, yellow. Skin tones usually go more pink. sRGB is not how this um, MX sensor, or actually Dragon sensor, was supposed to be debayed. Um, so technically speaking, we should be using the color science that was associated with that sensor. In this case, Dragon Color 2, which is the latest Dragon sensor color science. Now, we, there is a whole other world that we um, can talk about in another, another episode, which is Red's new, um, workflow, which supports HDR and a wider color space, all that crap. But we're just going to stick with Dragon Color 2 because that's the color, that's the sensor that this was shot on. If you shot this on a Red Scarlet X or an Epic MX, any MX sensor, 
don't choose dragon color, you would choose red color three, red color two, or red color. Because these color science um, or color spaces were associated with those MX sensors. Um, yeah, and if you know anything about red, you've got the M sensor, the MX sensor, the dragon sensor, they've got the helium sensor. So technically speaking, you should be using the right one for the right chip. But that's all changing apparently. Um, I read on the forums the other day that you use this for all red cameras, which kind of doesn't really make sense to me. Um, anyway, in this case, we're going to be matching our color space with the sensor that was recorded. Now, the next one is the gamma curve. The gamma curve, um, we're just going to be looking at two, and I'll show you what I mean. If we set this to red log film, and go ahead and press save, and then right click on one of these and choose update all thumbs, you can see that all the clips all of a sudden magically turn into log mode as if they were shot flat. For those who don't really understand, or I couldn't really be bothered explaining this too much, and you probably already know anyway. So now we're, we have the ability to grade all these shots as if they were recorded in log, and that's the beauty of RAW. We can change that whenever we want. So yeah, like I said earlier, this would be the normal thing for a professional colorist to do, right? No, not necessarily. I mean, yes, we can add our own contrast now. We can mess with this in ways that you can't do using a red gamma curve instead of a red log curve. And that's what log's all about, right? You can either use a LUT to de-log it, or you can create your own contrast curve, add your own saturation, do all that sort of thing. But to me, it's sort of... It's a hell of a lot more work, for one, and depending on your workflow. And what I mean by that is, um, we could, like if we were going to use a pre-LUT for this, go to Color Management, Set 3D Input Lookup Table, we're going to affect all this footage um, using a LUT, and we'll just use uh, one of these film look ones. And we're going to convert the log image to a Rec. 709 image, and as if it's being printed to a Kodak film stock. We go ahead and press Save, and we update all these thumbs. It makes more sense to use a Rec. 709 LUT on log footage because, I mean, we could mess with this now if we wanted to, okay? And it's already got color science baked in based on that Kodak LUT. But if you were to have um, your project settings for the camera raw set to red gamma 4, it's going to look fucked up. And I'll show you what I mean. Press save. It better. Um, <laughs> ah, yes, I'm glad um, yeah, it was user error. So I'm currently telling this clip n to ignore the project settings. So if we go to the settings, camera raw, red, here are my project settings. Um, but currently I've clicked on this clip, I've clicked on the camera debayer settings for that clip specifically, and I've said, hey, don't use the project settings, use the clip settings. And that's why we saw no update just then. If I choose project settings, now it's going to look fucked up. It's basically you're doubling up the contrast because we have one input contrast under color management using this Rec. 709 LUT. Then that's being placed on top of another contrasty curve, which is red gamma 4. So this is what I mean by depending on your workflow, um, we just set that to no LUT selected. Now that makes more sense, right? We can um, reset that grade. Now every one of these shots doesn't look log anymore, but it also doesn't look like red gamma 4. It looks like whatever that Kodak LUT is um, that we had. So yeah, that's just a quick sort of crash course on how you could set up this project and why different workflows require different uh, settings. Okay, so I just, I don't know how to compress all this anymore. Um, and you know what? If I keep going, this tutorial is gonna go, well, it's not tutorial, this demo is gonna go for four hours. So we're gonna set this. Um, we're going to make sure that LUT is not part of our workflow. So we go to color management, we've got no LUT selected. We're also going to go to camera raw and make sure we use camera metadata. We're not actually going to set a project setting. So we go camera metadata and click save. And now let's right click update all thumbs and that's just going to show us what's going on. And make sure that this clip is using the project. So that all these clips now look as if they were shot on the day through Devon's monitor. Ugh. Okay, so how what do I do from here? We've set up our project. We know we're working in the correct color space. We know we're debayering the footage we want to debayer in, in the way we want to debayer it. And we're ready to start grading, right? So usually what I do is just go through and it's like, ah, oh, just have a quick look. Another way um, to do it is just press Control Shift F, uh, which goes into light box mode. Control Shift F. I'm not even going to give Mac shortcuts because I hate Mac, so I don't even care. But Control Shift F on a PC um, gives you this light box mode. 
Another shortcut for that is just clicking this light box. Anyway, light box mode allows you to um, look at all the clips in the timeline and it gives you a good idea of the color palette that's already there. Because you've got to remember with color grading, when I approach um, a project, it's very important to pay tribute to things that were included in the frame, colors that were chosen for the frame. Depending on the budget of the project and how committed people were on the day, those things are very important to the color grade. I mean, they're color elements in the scene that you should be respecting in a certain way. And that's the way I look at it anyway, especially after my little meeting with Devin regarding what he wanted to do with the color. So, um, this is something that I'll do. I'll sort of go through and I'll be like, okay, what am I noticing here? I'm noticing this beautiful tan color, this leather here, which looks awesome. I like that, and I also like it in conjunction with the blue. And, you know, we've all heard teal orange is just overdone, but fuck it. Teal orange looks good for a reason. They're complementary colors, and skin is orange, has elements of orange in it. Now, what I'm going to look at and, and try and focus on is not necessarily a teal orange Hollywood look. It's more just teal and blue. Oh, sorry, orange and blue. Well, this tan color and this cool blue color. So I'm going to try and use that because it seems to be a theme. We've got a nice blue shirt here um, with blue bag there, and then we've got the tan leather. We've got a blue jacket blue background, tan skin, we've got beautiful tan colored skin here as well. You know, it could be a theme that we could run with. Even here, we've got a lot of blue in this scene, blue building, and then we've got this orange sunset, which I could try and match with that tan color as well. So, I think that's what I'm going to go for. Um, and now what I need to do is, okay, so I've got a general idea of where I want to go. I've got a general idea of the overall exposure that we're working with. So there's already a level of contrast here, and that contrast we should also respect, you know, the DP has lit this in a certain way. We're not looking at a log image here, we're looking at an image that they lit. Um, so we need to, you know, take that into account as well. So now what I'm going to do is look for some shots that inspire me and look for some shots that are sort of how, are going to give us a reference maybe for the entire film. Um, and in this case, you know, I like wide shots, but I also like shots with skin. So I mean, this one might be nice. It has a nice contrast range has highlights we have like we can put blues in the shadow we can mess with that but something that has skin is usually a better bet and this is definitely an inspiring shot um, this chick here so if I get out of lightbox mode and we just have a quick look at this shot we go full screen Focused on quality. all right so we got this shot here and I think this is the one we're gonna work with this is the one potentially this shot or this shot both of them have nice contrast they're nice to look at and they have that blue and that teal, uh, sorry, blue and that tan color in them already. Uh, so I th feel like it would be a bad idea to choose this shot and you know decide that hey we're going to try and match the whole project using this shot. That'd be a bad idea. It's going to be hard. There's not, there's no natural light. There's not a lot of contrast in the shot. There's no face in the shot. It's not really wide. So you know I think that would be a bad idea to use as a reference. Um, so we're going to create our own reference shot, and I think I'm going to use either one of these three shots, potentially this shot. Um, and remembering that we are decoding this using a Rec. 709-ish look. Now you might be thinking, hey, that doesn't make sense. Don't you want to work with log? Don't you want the maximum dynamic range possible? Well, yes and no. Like if we have a look at our histogram here, a waveform monitor, sorry, there's no information being clipped apart from like a couple of tiny little bits here at the top which are irrelevant to specular highlights. The bulk of the image is beautifully exposed. We've got a really nice exposure. We've got nice contrast range. Let's stick with that and let's modify it a little bit. You need to remember as well, when you're working with raw footage, right? There is no, you, you don't automatically get more dynamic range and have a better quality shot by working in log. If I go to clip, change the gamma curve to log, right? And then I grade this. This there is no advantage in in terms of the final output, right? Between this and starting from this. The only difference is my curve just looks a little bit different. Right? My saturation's already in there. And I feel like, you know, for a job like this, we're not spending days on it. We you know, we need to, we need to do a good job, but it's not like a 15 second spot that's for L'Oreal, you know, they spent 150 grand on. We need to get this job done fairly quickly, but we need to, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you don't always have to work with log, and that's exactly why. There's still all the range that you have in this raw file using Red Gamma 4, especially with a shot like this that's not clipped. 
So in no way do you get more quality or a better looking image by using red log film. It's just a different workflow. So just make sure you understand that. That is not the case if this was not raw. That's just another discussion for another day. So let's go ahead and start grading this shot. It's already got some baked in looks um, based on that red gamma curve. Um, but what I'm gonna do now is embarrassingly show you how I would do this. So I'm a curves guy. Um, <laughs> It's true in um, most aspects of life, but a couple of ways we could um, manipulate contrast here. Um, and I do want to give this a little more contrast. I do want to bring my blacks down a little bit and make it just a little more punchy. So I'm just going to do that using my curve like so. And instantly, if we go here, Control D, it almost looks like we come from a log image. So have I lost information in here? I have a little bit. Does that worry me? Not at all. What's the focus here? The focus is this watch face. The focus is this cool reflection passing on the window. Google by collaboration. All right. So, so far, I mean, I already like this shot. And I'm just going to create a new album here because we're going to start saving looks. But maybe I just want to emphasize a few things now. So I'm already happy with, you know, with this tiny little curve adjustment. Bang. I'm, I'm real happy with this shot. Thankfully, it looked great in camera already. But how can I just sort of take it next level? Of course, you see a watch face, you just can't help but do this. Now that's just, just naturally what your brain wants to do, right? You just wanna put something there because you can, and we can track it so easily. Do we need to though? That's another question. Is that gonna look better? Do we need to sharpen this? I mean, these are sort of things that tutorials will tell you you need to do. But is it more just because tutorials want to tell you how to do cool shit? I don't know if this is really going to enhance this shot. But maybe I do want to add a little more focus here and have a little less focus over there. So let's just add um, a very simple shape. Something like this. And um, I'm always pressing Shift H just to have a look at what I'm actually going to be modifying. Something like that. And what I'm going to do is just inverse that. So I click on here, inverse it. And now you can see this is what I'm affecting. This gives you a really good idea of what you will be affecting. So we could probably soften that less and expand it more. Something like that. All right, so now I'm playing with the outside of this watch. And instead of actually focusing in and sharpening the watch, I'm just going to do the opposite to the background. Just subtle. Something like that. OK. Now the next thing I might want to do is bump up the saturation and give this like a real look. Even though saturation is already pretty awesome, uh, we need to turn that off. So um, you can see that this skin tone line is almost matching this um, leather color here, which is pretty cool. But the other thing we need to consider um, is this color palette that we decided on. You know, this blue and this tan. One thing I kind of don't like is how what would you call that deep blue that is it, it's almost purple so I want to push away from purple a little bit and go towards more of a teal color um, so to do that I'm actually going to place a node before my mask and I'm going to jump instead of using my qualifier I tend to jump straight for the curves these days um, when selecting a color range because they're just they're much better in Resolve 14 I feel like these curves they just work better than they used to I'm going to go hue versus hue and click on the color just to give me an idea of where that is. But you know what? I just want all the blues. So I'm going to go from here to here. And all right, let's just push this around to see what's happening. So my goal is just to tealize those blues a little bit. So here's that deep blue that we had a second ago. I'm just going to jump in the middle and push, push that more into a teal green color. Something like this. The teals... I actually kind of want to leave alone. So if I push the teals up, they're going to start going green. So I think I'm going to leave my teals where they are and just really focus on the blues. Yeah. All right, so there it is. I think this is uh, what I'm going to use. It's looking pretty good. So there's the original. There's my grade. Is it amazing? No. Do we have lens flares and cool effects? No. But this clip is going to look really good when I'm done with it, I promise. So I'm gonna right click, grab a still, have that there as a reference. Let's go ahead and have a look at the next shot. I'm lazy, I'm just gonna middle click on that and see what this looks like. So we'll just go back to our waveform monitor, just have a look at what's going on here. Have a look at our original curve. 
maybe just back off that contrast and wipe this on and off because right we're matching this now so this contrast here is probably a little strong although it matches this watch on the left um, I'm more interested in our hero which is this one here so what I'm looking to do now is just back the contrast off a little bit It's looking pretty good. Now let's just check our teal conversion. Very subtle here, but you can see that's happening. There's the original purpley blue, and then there's the more teal look that we got here. I think I do want to up the saturation. Maybe what I want to do is sort of bring out the emphasis in this tan color even more. Um, and also, while we're here, let's just check this because we were lazy, remember? We slapped it, we duplicated this grade. So I'm just going to move this around a bit. Um, Shift H, turn that off, and just make sure we see what we're doing with that. Not much at all. This is where we could get a little bit creative as well and try and emphasize this um, teal color a bit more and that separation. Uh, what I might do is just go Alt S and just grab this gradient node. And let's just try this. Pop this here. Let's just jump straight for the gain using primary wheels and just pull some more teal in there. Okay, so we've just added that teal look to the side of the screen a little bit more, remembering that our eye's gonna jump straight here anyway. So all we're doing is um, helping that color contrast. You can see here it's matching a little bit better over on that side. Let's just uh, teal it up a bit more, something like that. All right. I mean, you could pull a key and do it this way and make sure you don't affect that wood there but again like do we really need to do that it's fun to do it in a tutorial but you know this is a paying gig what's the goal here like how much time have we got how much money we be being paid these are important questions and how much is the client gonna notice I mean yeah if we're showing off on Instagram sure we pull a key here and we do it like that but anyway <laughs> now I'm gonna do exactly that because what I want to do is select this sort of tan color and I just want to punch it up a little bit more. So I've just clicked on the eyedropper and instead of using these refining tools, I like to just do it manually. So I'm just going to expand this range that I'm looking at. And I basically want to look at all the yellows and reds in this shot. And you'll notice it's got holes in there. So what are those holes? They're probably a lack of or not enough saturation selection. So here in our saturation selection, let's go down and that's exactly what that is. And um, then we need to look at things like the low and high range in the luminance channel of what we're selecting in that color range too. Um, you know, am I worried about this? Not really. I'm really just worried about um, the straps themselves. So uh, one sort of tip whenever you're doing qualifiers is to watch it. Um, I'm gonna click loop here and watch this, press play. So how dancey are they? You know what, because um, you'll be qualifying someone's skin someday and you'll be like clean black, clean white, blur radius, fuck that's a nice key, press play and there's shit dancing everywhere, like thankfully this is nice and clean, um, but that's just a tip, always watch it back. And there's no need to blur things just by default, so yeah, you just want to get a nice key and select, know what you're selecting. All right. So this, this is pretty good, I'm happy with this. Notice how I put the key before this teal adjustment and before this darkening effect. And, and there's good reason for that. If I was to put this key after that, obviously the way Resolve works in Serial is that this qualifier is gonna have a, a tougher time selecting the color tan because the color tan has been darkened and it's been changed color. So you wanna do it before those adjustments. Anyway, so we got our key. And what I'm gonna do, um, there's probably 35 different ways we can do this. I'm gonna jump straight from my primary wheels, go to my mids, and just push the gamma up towards teal. So this is going pretty crazy. But I really wanna develop a look that sort of looks striking. Um, it's still got that high quality look. But again, this is the scary part of showing you this. If this is a real job, you know, it's scary. You'll notice I'm also clipping information here. I'm clipping color information. Is that bad? Technically it's bad. Visually it looks great, I'm happy. Let's have a look at our vector scope and see where our saturation lies. And just go to the settings here. Um, turn this up full. 
I think we're cool. I think we're looking fine. Don't we? Don't be too worried about getting like this perfect waveform. Be more worried about um, how it looks and is it the way you want it to look. The only thing you do need to be careful about, and that's why I did check the vector scope. If you've got colors that are sort of reaching out around here and down here, that's shit can get fucked up then. You're going to start getting real weird artifacting when you export to a 10-bit space or an 8-bit space. Um, generally with um, luminance on the waveform monitor, when you clip highlights and shadows, it basically always looks the way it looks to your eye whenever you render out in lower bit depth. But with color, it's not that way. If you, you know, if I just give you an example, if we were to do something like that, this is going to look fucked up. There's potential that this will come out like sort of blue or like have a hole in it or there'll be like weird artifacts and shit. So you got to be careful with saturation, especially. Anyway. To me, this is looking good. Do we try and rescue those highlights there? Nah, fuck that. We don't have time for this. This looks a little hot here. So maybe um, where is our selection here? I'm going to create an outside node. And let's just bring this down a bit. So we go waveform. And I wonder what we are clipping here in that blue channel. It's probably up here. Looks like it. We could probably fix that, but who cares? So yeah, that just brings that down. Not so hot. We've still got great contrast. All right, and we're still, you know what? This one's looking a little desaturated now. So we might go back and add that same qualifier. So maybe I should have used this for my master. Anyway, um, there's another thing I want to do for this shot, and that is sort of clean up this left-hand side here. When I say clean up, just take some focus away from it. We've already got a mask here that covers that area. So technically I could just blur this one, just go to my blur tab and just smash it. And see what that's doing. You know, I've blurred that a lot, but I think that's fine. Again, the goal is to get your eye away from this side of the frame and to look here. And the other sort of general consensus with doing something like that is you want to have the brightest part of the image the, the most important part, right? Because the human eye will always look to the sharpest, brightest area of the frame. But sometimes it's also nice to give your shot um, a bit of reference to where the light might be coming from. So there'll be times where even though I don't want you to look here, I'll actually like bring the light up. Obviously not like that. But the, the point is that I'll brighten this side of the frame and you still ignore it because, I don't know, it sort of gives your brain an idea. It's just a reference point for, ah, that's where the light's coming from. So that's another way you can um, deal with areas like this. But anyway, I'm just going to leave that as is. And now that we've tanned up that a lot, I'm going to add a bit more blue in the right one. Okay. We could add a little bit of focus to this Jack Mason logo, but it's out of focus and it's a bit scratched. So I think we're just going to leave it. And yeah, maybe while we're here, just very quickly undo this and we'll just track this. Probably don't need to track it. Um, and just add a little bit of sharpness of focus here. Let's just sharpen that up a little bit. It looks better. For sure. All right. So I'm going to right click, grab a still, save that. That's um, my new reference shot. We're just going to quickly revisit this shot. Um, and we're going to select that tan color again. Okay. What aren't we selecting there? Hmm. Super low saturated highlights. Okay. I'm more interested in the bands, not so much the table. And I wonder, since this shot is so static, I wonder if it's worth just ignoring that table as best we can. 
So just doing something like this. And that way we just we don't have to worry about creating a perfect key. We're just keying it out using a mask. Um, so while we've got that on, we can soften the edge a bit just in case we fucked it up a little bit. Anyway, so now we've got a much better key on the bands themselves. And let's go ahead and brighten them up. Brighten them up, what I mean is just increase saturation. It's really gonna help. You know, it's subtle. So off, on, off, on, off. Look how green and sort of washed out that looks. On, it's more tanny. And up here, off, on. That's really gonna help with that color separation. So I'm gonna delete that, still grab that one, put it over here. Okay, so we're off to a flying start. Obviously spent way too much time. And that's because um, I'm sort of scared about doing a really good job for you guys, but also doing a quick job because this is, imagine, um, this is a paying job. So, you know, technically I should just move on like this throughout the frame. But you also gotta do things that make you happy. <laughs> what shots interest me now? Like, what am I excited to work on? This one, um, is definitely going to be challenging. One, because it's underexposed compared to these. It's lacking um, some serious contrast. Like this has that beautiful sunlight coming in, whether it was um, one of the HMIs or um, the Joker, or whether it's real sunlight. The point is um, this contrast, this hard light is looking fantastic. And then to cut to this shot, which is underexposed with soft light, it's going to be a challenge to match that. And also we need to fix things like white balance. We've got to up the exposure. We can try and fix that chromatic aberrations. Um, so let's go ahead and do that actually before we go into the easier cool fun shot down here uh, We will work on this next and this will be a good example actually of where I am going to go and to the DBA settings for the clip itself and it's where I'm going to mess with this now because I Want to play with the white balance and things like that. I don't want to use white balance sliders here You know, this is shit compared to using real raw debayer. So that's the awesome thing about raw So here we are um, dragon color 2 great Red Gamma 4, fine. You know, if we went red log film, I'd have to re-add my contrast. Fuck that. Let's just go Red Gamma 4. Whoops. And, all right, here's the important part, um, color temperature. So, here's our reference, and this is a shot before it, right? We got this sort of cool white balance. You'll notice even the blacks aren't black anymore, they're cool. So the white balance is technically probably wrong, or the light coming through the window is being tinted blue. But the point is, that our tan color and our teal color are important here. And I wanna match those somewhat. Now, um, first of all, uh, the first problem here is the exposure. Before even the white balance, the exposure is just way under in terms of what I think it should look like. Um, so I'm gonna try and fix that. I could use ISO. So we could jump up a stop or half a stop and go to 1600 ISO. I'm gonna go higher, I'm gonna go to 2000 ISO. Now, when you go to 2000 ISO, um, let me just loop this and turn audio off. Um, it's quite noisy, but it's not too bad. And we're going to have a look at using some noise reduction algorithms and how we can fix this up. And we're also going to fix that chromatic aberration. But the point is, I just want to get my exposure in a better place. So how do I decide what good exposure is? Hey, why are they different? Um, yeah, where was I? So, where does this watch sit in terms of exposure? Let me grab a quick mask and pop that here and let's just have a look at our waveform monitor. So, if we ignore those specular highlights and cut those off, have a look at sort of the gist of the uh, watch. You notice it sits around here, brightest parts up around 768 and then it sort of dips down here to 128 so it's got a quite nice high contrast exposure range but that's basically just because it's got white bits and black bits so not necessarily super useful what about the tanned thing okay remember it's got direct sunlight on it so this is you know we're even clipping the red channel here so probably not a very useful shot to use as a guide in terms of exposure but let's have a look at this now See where this band sits. A lot more of this exposure lies way below 512. So do I want to bring it up even higher? Do I want to, let's, let's have a look. If I was to erase exposure, we could go to the ISO 2500. 
And I think that's probably a good place. We've got a nice range here now. If we was to set that back to, I think it was a thousand ISO, you can see, you know, it's definitely under. So I'm going to go 2000 ISO. And now let's play with the white balance. So the goal is not necessarily to get a perfect white balance because there's a whole bunch of workflows you can use. Um, and when I'm grading a film, typically if a film was all shot in the same room and I'm cutting between people, what I'll do is I'll go through each shot and I'll just before giving it a look, like we've done here, we're sort of grading and looking at the same time. But before giving it a look, what I'll do is I'll go through and just balance every shot. Perfect white balance, perfect exposure. And that's my goal. But in this, it's a commercial and we've got different locations. They're not people talking to each other in the same room. So continuity isn't necessarily as important. And we also don't have the sort of the time and the luxury to be doing that. So my goal here is I'm going to use the white balance to sort of get to a place that's like similar to this. And for those of you who don't understand what tint means, so or color balance, surely you do, right? The higher number, the warmer it goes. The lower number, the cooler it goes. So blue and red, right? Reset. The tint is literally just green and magenta. Not the other way around for red. So the right hand side gives you green and the left hand side makes it more magenta. The whole point of having a tint compensation is for using, uh, when you're using like fluorescent lights or when you have a light source that has a cast, whether it's magenta or green, you can fix that bias. Um, and that's very useful for when you're trying to perfectly color correct, uh, color balance a scene. Um, say I was to use the white of this face. I'm looking here at 640, exactly where that white is. And if I set this to how it was, 5600. Actually, I don't even think it was. Anyway, point is, oh yeah, made it. Is it's not perfectly white balanced. You can see that there's a shift in green and magenta. So we could fix that with a tint. And that's exactly what I've done just there. So technically here we have pretty nice white balance. Um, the grey in the background is grey, the white's white, our tan colour, even though it's under exposed compared to our tan colour here, it's looking pretty similar. So I'm pretty happy with this. It's a challenging shot. Now, um, in terms of white um, noise reduction, there's a couple of ways you can do this. Do you noise redu uh, reduce the shot now? So, I mean, I'll go through these in a second. But do we do noise reduction now and then start doing our color grading, adding contrast, adding highlights and shit like that? Or do you do your color grading and then at the end go ahead and do noise reduction? Well, from my experience, I think color grading, uh, noise reducing at the end gives better results. It retains more detail. The caveat there would be if I was trying to pull a key and create transparency based on a chroma key background or a black background, I would usually clean up the image first and put noise reduction at the beginning. But for a general color grade, I like to put the noise reduction at the end. And of course, you don't have to noise reduce the whole shot. You could just, you know, go to the shadows and turn our highlights on and just ignore the highlights and only use noise reduction in the shadows. And that's exactly what I'm doing here. So I could noise reduce the shit out of that, but I'm actually not touching the face. So I've just noise re reduced the background and a little bit of this. Obviously I've gone way too far, but the point is you don't have to put noise reduction on the entire thing. Anyway, we'll do noise reduction at the end is my point. So how are we going to match these two shots? They don't have to match perfectly. Um, at the moment, things are looking pretty good. We're going to add that blue tint in a second. But first what I want to do is um, maybe play with some focus. So, classic, shift H. I'm gonna go straight to the outside and just back it off. Just helping add that contrast. It's really missing and there's so much contrast here. Not a lot of contrast here. So that's helping add some contrast. It's also taking the focus away from the edges a little bit. Do we blur it just a smidge? Why not? Okay, so that's looking better-ish. 
do we try and pull a key on these tan things and brighten them up a little bit? Sure. But we're going to do that before I use that. So Shift S. Let's go ahead and grab the tan color. Um, clean that. Clean that up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I wonder. Okay. Remember, I said you should watch it and look how dancey it is. That's what I mean. That's dancing like a motherfucker there. Dangerous. So, what is that? What are we struggling to do? The shadows. Whenever sort of looking for problems with a qualifier, it's good to just turn off entire sections. So let's just turn off saturation. What is saturation doing for us? If we limit the saturation range to here, is it helping the key? It is. Now if we mess with that, and s I've got a big rant about this qualifier, by the way. I don't know if I should save it for another day. Um, so saturation, I think, is doing us justice. And part of the problem is there's these areas of color that are so undersaturated and they they're the dancing parts the parts in here right um so shift h now let's watch this still got some dancing we may not be able to fix this sure we can Remember, we can turn this on and off as well. All right, I'm going to clean the shit out of it. You know, this isn't someone's face. We can we can afford to be more ruthless with this key. I mean, really, what's the goal? Just to make these wristbands just pop out a little bit more. The reason I'm sort of being a bit more fussy with my key is because I'm not just going to change the color of them, or the tint. I actually want to make them brighter. And you have to be so careful when actually increasing the brightness or the luminance of something that you select because it can just stand out and look shit. You can see the edges of it. Anyway, um, let's see how this key goes. Um, and I will do the old garbage map trick as well just like we did a second ago and just say hey ignore these areas cool and we better watch that on the zoom in because it does dolly in all right cool so let's bring this back up and we don't have to match these exactly remembering they're in different lighting conditions but i do want to brighten this up a smidge so i'm going to go here Probably just go straight for the shadows and check it out. That's looking better. It's looking much closer. It looks like it's in the same store. And now let's actually make sure we watch it and see if we can see any issues. I can't see any issues. Things are looking pretty good. All right. I'm happy with that. Um, so how do we now introduce this blue color? Do we have to do that? Not necessarily. But I reckon we could. I reckon we could get away with it. So um, let's just have a look at what we've done here. We're going to know that's doing nothing. Let's delete that. <laughs> uh, we've got a qualifier for the band. We've done a little bit of processing in raw here to get the exposure and the white balance correct. And then we've got a focus node, which sort of brings your attention to the center of the frame a little bit more. Um, so what about if I shift S and put a node in the middle here? Um, and we just try and add some blues to the mids so make sure in the primary wheels and I'm just going to go here to the gamma settings and pull this down All right, so that's too much but the goal is to get that sort of teal color in here somewhere and maybe it's a good idea to add it to the mids but look ex look as soon as what as soon as we do that our tan color turns a yucky green so how are we going to fix that easy so instead of adding a serial node after this Right, which will process everything that's happened in this node will now get processed in this. So if I pull blue in here, 
it'll make everything blue that's happened after this node. So instead of doing that, let's add an outside node which uses the alpha channel, the opposite alpha channel of this. In other words, we're going to look at everything that's not selected here. To do that, Alt-O gives you an outside node, and as you can see the structure here, let's just zoom that in, um, you can see that the RGB is being fed here, but the alpha channel, the inverted alpha channel coming from here is now being fed here. Um, and let's just see how that's going to help us. So now if I pull blue, you'll notice that the tan selection color is not being affected, and that's exactly what we want. So that's just a real shortcut, quick way, quick and dirty way really to Alt-O gives you an outside node of the selection you had a second ago. Let's bring this up here and let's pull that teal color in gently. I just want it to be a hint. I actually don't really want it there, but it's just going to help everything match a little bit nicer in the end and make it look like we we're a colorist and we knew what we were doing. <laughs> so you can see the before and after there. You know, we're staying true to our look. Always look at your master shots as well. The contrast is just seriously lacking. Maybe I do want to punch up this watch face a little bit. Uh, okay. You know, because everything sort of, and my whites have gone green now. So this is another problem. I could have been more meticulous with, meticulous with my node structure and whatnot, but we're just going to be lazy. I'm just going to correct the white. Uh, face now. So we'll just drop this here, shrink this down, and let's just track it. And let's just have a look at it, make sure we're. Okay. I mean, my goal here is literally just to fix the white balance on the watch face. Something like that. Actually, I might select more of the silver as well because that is also a problem area that's being tinted by my uh, my node over here. Um, so my goal now is um, just to correct the white on this face, and also probably just to punch it up a little bit. So I just want to add a little bit more yeah, from there to there. It's looking pretty cool. Whenever you relight something, whether it's someone's face, whether it's a watch's face, generally this is a great general tip. Generally, if you're using curves to do it, I generally unlink RGB because what happens when you um, play with linked YRGB, not only are you increasing luminance, you're also increasing saturation for all channels. Generally speaking, when you brighten up an underexposed area and you increase saturation for that underexposed area, it can look yucky. <laughs> this is a bad example, but generally unlink and just grab your Y for a relight. And um, just trust me on that, just have an experiment with it. You can always add saturation um, to the highlights later on, doing something like that. But in this case, my goal is just to brighten that up. And not only brighten it up, but I want to balance it out. So we could use this white balance slider, but I'm not going to recommend doing that. But that's one way to do it. So now we've fixed the white balance there. Looks much better. All right, and if we compare this to this, it probably looks a bit stark now, it looks a bit weird. Um, the cool thing, uh, oh yeah, so I said don't use this. Generally speaking, I would just normally go straight for my gain or my gamma, depending on how exposed this was, and just bounce that out like this. Basically doing the same thing. All right. Uh, and what I was going to say is, let's just back this off. You just want to brighten up just a smidge. And while we're here, I'm going to add another one of these. So I'm going to click circle again, pop this over here, and shrink that bad boy down. So already, you know, if this was a real job, I'm earning like $3 an hour <laughs> because of how long it's taking me. Anyway, let's go ahead and track that. We could probably get away with another one on the other mask, even though there's no white the silver is still going to benefit from our shit. All right. 
pretty cool, pretty cool. We haven't done any noise reduction yet, so it still looks a bit shit. Um, but there is another thing I wanted to do, and that was potentially tackle this problem of um, chromatic aberration. So we've got this blue fringing here, and that's just, um, you know, it happens even with some of the most expensive lenses in, in the world. You've got extreme high contrast situation, and you get chromatic aberration, and it's also called fringing. It depends on the sensor and the optical low-pass filter and all that sort of shit. Problem is, it's a problem. Um, we've also got this sort of blue watch face um, text, and I think I asked Evan, is it supposed to be blue? And I think he said yes, but to me, I don't like it. I want to make it black, because to me it looks like fringing. It looks like chromatic aberration. So <laughs> I'm just going to cancel all that, and um, bad luck. <laughs> um, so how do we do this? Um, again, whenever we're doing selections, you want to sort of put them before any of your focus adjustments like this. Um, so I'm going to even put it before the teal, um, the tan color selection. I'm going to zoom in, and I'm going to click on the blue, and then Shift H. Sorry, I'm going to make sure I'm on my qualifier, and click on the blue, Shift H. Okay, and let's just expand the width. So also, because usually blue and magenta are, are what happens with chromatic aberration on one end of the spectrum, or yellow and or, uh, green. But in this case, it's blue and magenta. And we're going to try and just check to see what we're actually selecting here. Yeah, okay, so there is fringing chromatic aberration there. Um, we are selecting the watch face thingies. A bit bad luck. I want to cancel those. Cancel by, I want to desaturate them. Um, so we could definitely do a better job here. What are we missing? Some of the highlights, yes. And this lower saturation range. Okay, so I'm going to clean this up. And this is one where we can blur the shit out of it and expand the ratio. Because the thing with fringing is it does bleed out quite a lot outside of where you think it does. That didn't sound very professional, did it? Okay, so let's go ahead and um, have a look at how we would fix this. Your initial instinct might just be to say, hey, we want to desaturate the blue, so I'm just going to go to here and just go and just kill them. And that works, right? Check it out. There's the original. It is looking better. But um, that's general, generally bad practice, generally. Um, in this case, it didn't really matter. And what I mean by that is if you're ever trying to fix a color cast or get rid of a color like a green um, exit sign and you want to make it gray, I find that if you jump straight for saturation and zero it, it can look funny, it can look weird. I find that if you balance it, in other words, you push the opposite color of blue into the shot and you try and balance it this way, you're gonna get, what have I done, what have I done? This is what I mean by embarrassing. I think I clicked on this weird thing. Oh, yeah. uh, so we're pushing the opposite color of blue in, but then it's just not gonna work. Maybe I suck at this. You get the idea though, right? So technically, you, this will work. I'm just shit at it. And I don't have trackballs, so I can't do it all at once. Mm -mm. And that way, you still get a little bit of blue. It looks a little bit more natural. But fuck that. Maybe this is the better way. Maybe just leave a little bit in there. Okay, finally, um, you know, I'm happy with chromatic aberration. It's mostly fixed. We don't have time to do any more than that. Um, what about our watch faces? I'm just going to add a parallel note here and sort of keep things in line with each other and this adjustment that I want to do right now I want it to happen independently of this adjustment and that's why I've created a parallel node here and I'm just going to create another circle like so and I'm just going to bump the contrast up I want these black watch face thingies to be blacker um, so there's a thousand different ways to do that first of all let's just track this shot Okay, 
Um, now I'm going to jump straight for my log controls. So not primary bars, not primary wheels, log. Why? Because log is a more um, harsh selection between shadows, midtones, and highlights. And in this case, I really just want to focus on the blacks. I mean, I could add an anchor point here and do it like this. But I'm going to use log controls just because it's something I've been doing a lot, and I think it works. So you can see, I can quickly just mess with the shadows and bring them down like so. Add that little bit more contrast. Yeah. It's not perfect, is it? We don't have time to be perfect, but look how much closer and how much better it matches with this. That's the point. Finally, you know, maybe, I don't know, this sort of goes against our um, theory here where we're drawing focus to the center. Maybe we have a light source coming from the left-hand side, because we do, right? Maybe we emphasize that. So instead of having this shape like this, maybe we have the shape like this. So that way we're giving the light that's coming from the left more of a voice. You know what I mean? The only problem is it sort of gives us a little bit more focus here on the left. So we could punch it down even more. And I guess my goal here is um, I'm trying to match this idea where we've got these heavy shadows on the right, a bright light source on the left. So not only am I matching color, I'm also trying to match the contrast of the scene and relight it, like literally relight it. You can get a bit more ballsy with it. Something like that. Maybe that's, maybe that's cool. I don't know. Let's just get rid of our blur for now. Leave it grainy. I think I, think I do like that more. And you know what? Just because I'm lazy, I'm just going to add another node. And I'm always jumping for this guy. Pop this over here. I'm just going to go a little bit more crazy with that. Cool. I think that looks pretty cool. Um, finally, let's go ahead and add some noise reduction. So I'm going to add a note at the very end. And let's just have a quick crash course in noise reduction because there's a bunch of options here and they don't really make sense even if you read the manual, which is not up to date. <laughs> I know it's a massive job. I'm not trying to be um, a dick there. But, um, so we've got temporal noise reduction and spatial noise reduction. The gist of it is temporal noise reduction analyzes movement and it tries to apply noise reduction to things that aren't moving. That is the basic gist of noise reduction, uh, temporal noise reduction. If you've got someone running and dancing in the middle of the frame, you generally don't want to reduce the noise in that movement because that movement has motion blur and detail that's important, right? But things like the black wall or the gray wall behind it, which is dancing with noise, we want to kill that. So instead of creating a key, you can't exactly say, hey, Resolve, I want to key motion. There is no way we can key motion. But you can if you use this temporal noise reduction. And that's the whole point of it. So there's a, um, a few things to consider when using temporal noise reduction. And it'll generally give you better results because it'll try and keep detail in things that um, are moving and destroy detail in things that aren't moving. So is it really going to help us in this shot? Not necessarily because there's fuck all movement, right? So it's not really going to be um, efficient at doing its job or doing what temporal noise reduction does best. But let's do it anyway. So the frames mean how many frames forward and back is it going to look to decide where to build its algorithm from. The more frames you choose, the more accurate it is. Cool. The motion estimate type. Do you want to choose a shit one or a good one? If you choose a shit one, it happens quicker. But fuck that, using noise reduction, like, just choose the better one. So always choose better. Motion range. How much movement in, is in the shot? Is there a dancer in the middle doing a hip hop dance going crazy or is just a watch face barely moving? There's a watch face barely moving. So the motion range is small. Then finally we say, okay, so now let's add some noise reduction to this shot. Now there's an important thing to consider before you add noise reduction and decide that you're happy with it. Right now, if I add noise reduction, right, so I add that much, so I add fucking that much, and I go full screen, and my client's there, and we're like, fuck yeah, it looks sick, noise reduction done. You've just failed. <laughs> because 
remember our raw settings. Let's go to the project, camera raw. Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> well, I thought I had this set to half res good. So that would be a dangerous situation where let's do it with quarter res. Let's switch this to quarter res, click save, all right? So now we're debarring this at a lower resolution than it actually is. Noise looks worse than it is. Detail looks worse than it is. And if we smash the noise reduction and we use this as a guide, that's a bad idea because you're not actually looking at a full debayer noise reduction result. Um, so yeah, that's just something to be very careful of when working with RED or any raw footage. We want to decode at full res premium 16 bit whenever we're doing noise reduction. Anyway, let's have a look. We know how this works. What about the temporal threshold? Basically what this is saying is, based on this algorithm that you've chosen up here where DaVinci decides what to add and not add noise reduction to, how much noise reduction do you want to add? And there is no, um, these numbers are arbitrary. They don't reflect anything specifically. They're not pixel amounts. This is just a number between zero, no noise reduction, and 100, maximum noise reduction. Then there's basically this motion slider that says how much of the motion do you want to apply the, the noise reduction to? If I was to set this to 100 maximum and I set this to 100, that's going to basically apply noise reduction to everything, moving or not. If you set this to zero, that's basically going to apply noise, not going to apply noise reduction at all. And I can prove that by, even though we've got 100% luma, 100% chroma, if I go full frame and turn this node on and off, absolutely nothing is happening. And that's because this is kind of like you could say a opacity slider for motion. How much of the motion, the movement and pixels in this frame do you want to apply noise reduction to? If you say zero, no noise reduction is applied. So it's kind of like, it's different to blend because it's based off motion. But um, yeah, that's basically what that does. So the goal is to leave it at what it was, which is something I think about 10, and slide this off to the left. Now, this is um, also very important. Whenever you're doing noise reduction, it's tempting to do this actual size. Have a look at it like this. Let's just get rid of our clips and our timeline here. All right, we're looking here and then we like, we get our mouse and we start increasing the noise reduction amount, sorry. And basically what you wanna do is, you wanna get rid of the noise, but you wanna keep detail. So you wanna look at something that has detail like this watch band, set it to zero. And we have some nice detail. If we set it to 100, it still does a pretty damn good job. And that's the beauty of temporal noise reduction. It generally does a better job than spatial. We'll get to spatial in a second. But I would never recommend doing 100, never. Anyway, so basically what you're gonna do is you start slide it up, and you can see most of the noise disappears by around 20 in this particular shot, which we smashed. We set this exposure two stops over what it was recorded at, I think, almost, which is quite a lot for an underexposed low-key lighting. Um, but you can see now that Temporal noise reduction set to the best quality um, with a motion range that matches the clip that we're working with set to about 20. It's looking pretty damn good. Now the beauty here is there's also chroma noise reduction and these luma and chroma noise reduction values are linked. If we unlink them, sometimes what you'll notice is you've got a rid of enough luma noise, but you'll still have some chroma noise and that's actually not the case here but there might be a shot later on where this will be the case. And this is where you can smash chroma. Like, if you do chroma noise reduction at 50, I'm not gonna be mad. <laughs> Especially with a scene like this where we don't really have important skin tones or a highly detailed jumper that's covered in all this color detail that we're gonna smish. So um, that's a sort of a crash course. Then finally, we have this amount that we've noise reduced. And we need to make sure that we watch that full res, full debayer, 16 bit on our preview monitor with our grade. Are we happy with that noise reduction? That's what I was gonna say a second ago. You need to watch this on the screen at the size that it's gonna be delivered at. Don't watch it zoomed in. You need to watch it at a, a nice viewing distance and then decide, is that a good amount of noise reduction? Because no wonder that you have to pay for noise reduction. It's sort of like alcohol. You can't just give it to a kid and just go, go crazy. It's like, you gotta be careful with noise reduction. You gotta, you gotta be tasteful with it. So anyway, that's looking pretty good. This shot is pretty easy to noise reduce. 
Um, there's another option here which is blend, and this is basically opacity. How much of the noise reduction do you want? If you blend it by 100, there's no noise reduction. If it's zero, it's full noise reduction. So what you can do is you can sort of go over what you should and then start blending it back with the original. And that gives you a nice sort of middle ground where you've got noise, you've got a bit of texture, but you've also removed most of the noise. So that's looking pretty good. Now the ultimate, um, you know, if you're still not happy, and just while I look at this, I'm just not happy with this. I'm just, bit more contrast there, that's looking better. If you're still not happy with your noise reduction, then you can use, in addition to temporal noise reduction, spatial. Spatial literally just looks at the entire image, looks for noise profiles, and you decide how much of a sample it chooses. Um, so first of all, don't use faster, use better. Just use better, because what's the point in doing crappy noise reduction? So use better, but this radius is important. Um, just imagine that we selected a profile for DaVinci to do noise reduction with. If you select a small profile, it's not going to do as good a job because the sample is smaller for it to work with. If you choose a larger profile, it's going to give you a better result. That's a crash course on spatial noise reduction. It does the whole entire image. It doesn't key out certain things and decide to noise reduce um, movement or not. Then we've got the blend amount, oh, sorry, the spatial um, threshold. And this is just literally the same as this. How much noise reduction do you want to do? Now you'll, be, you'll notice this is a lot stronger than the temporal noise reduction. And if we just did this at 60, which is just way too much, you'll notice how, yeah, sure, the image looks clean, but it also looks plastic. It all looks like it's made out of shit. <laughs> um, that's when you can always like blend the hell out of it, like by about 85. And then you are adding some, you know, nice noise reduction, but my advice is to set blend to zero and just add a smidge. Yeah, so I'm thinking that looks pretty good. Is this shot done? Can we stop waffling on about this shot? We've spent an hour on it. Yes, it is. Um, let's bring back our gallery and our timeline and our clips, sorry. And you know what? For now, I'm going to right click, grab still, done. All right, next shot, moving on. Let's have a look. Uh, we, we've got to do the before and after, don't we? Before, after. It looks a bit weird. I don't know. Spent too much time on it already. We could always just mess with that tint. I think that's the thing that I don't like. So if we turn this on and off, that's that background tealy tint that I've chosen. And I think it's just a bit green. So what I'm going to do is just quickly go back and just mess with it a bit push it more towards blue instead. I think it's going to work better. I wonder. Hmm. That was my tealy one. There's my bluey one. I can't really decide. I'll save that one and we'll leave that as is for now. Another way to do it is sort of just watch it back and see if they flow nicely. That, that's one we'll just come back to. Um, now what I'm going to do is uh, jump to these start shots. Oh, nah, I just want to do this. I want to do this shot. I love this shot. It's so sick. And I'm going to use this as a guide, so I'll delete this one. All right. So, we're having a look at this clip. It's currently being decoded as per the project settings. I don't want that. Remember I said I want this, all of these clips to be decoded as they were shot in camera. So we can do that per clip by choosing camera metadata here. And it looks exactly the same. <laughs> oh yeah, because my project says camera metadata as well. Anyway. It just looks a little bit flat to me, that's all. I wonder why. Anyway. Um, all right, so this is an instance where we have Rec 709. Like, remember we went and had a look at this shot, right? And we just reset that. That's how it looked in camera. Nice contrast range. This shot as beautifully lit and exposed as it is, it's very soft light, but the contrast range is much, you know, we're lacking contrast, even though we are looking at 
Red Gamma 4. But is this just... Interesting. So, what I'm getting at is we need to add contrast to this shot. Now, we can do that 32 different ways. We can do that using RAW. So we could, remember I'm always saying, you know, use RAW to do color balance um, and exposure settings. Why not use contrast to increase contrast? Well, just because there's not a lot of control using this contrast slider. And you'll notice my highlights aren't really going up. I could go to my brightness. What does brightness refer to? Who knows? And you can try and sort of clunkily do it in RAW, add some saturation, you know, fix this um, green in the skin. And like, that's looking pretty good, right? And we haven't even touched DaVinci's controls yet. I'm just going to reset that. But it's just clunky. Um, I much prefer to use a curve. I much prefer to use the controls of a colorist, right? Not just use these sliders and move them up and down. So let's go ahead, grab my curve, and I'm just going to manipulate the contrast in this shot based on how I want it to look. And remembering that we can always add power windows to things like a face if we want to bring up the brightness there. Okay, it's looking a little bit better. Maybe I want to crush these blacks a little bit. Instead of using a curve to do that, I'm going to go to log mode, lower my range in the blacks, and just drop them down. I could also correct them as well while I'm here. So um, next thing I'm noticing big time is just lack of saturation, especially when we look at our final graded shots. Um, but also, just contrast in general, I'm, I'm going to have to use a power window because if I try and use curves like this, I just feel like I'm going to blow her cheeks out. Blow... <laughs> that didn't sound so good. You know what I mean? And it just might be a little bit, a bit of a pain in the ass to use curves. Sometimes it's just easier to focus on what you want to focus on using a power window. And when you start messing with curves, especially in the midtones, it can start looking posterized, screwed. Okay. Yeah. Saturation. I'm going to create another node for saturation. And what I've been doing lately is just smashing the saturation to like there. The problem with using this saturation slider, so I've gone to say 80 from 50, is that you're saturating everything. You're saturating the side here. You can see um, we've got chroma noise now. We're saturating these shadows. I don't want to saturate those areas. So what I'll do is I'll sort of counteract myself. I'll increase saturation by 80 and then I'll go to luma versus saturation is back off saturation in the shadows. And sometimes in the highlights as well. Alright. So I'm using this as a guide with saturation, but I really should be using this as well. So we've got a similar saturation range there. Um, we have a look at our waveform. Have a look at our vector scope. Ah, did I notice something? No. Okay, so skin tones um, and the pink lips. If we have a look at the original shot, like this looks neutral and nice. It's got beautiful face and lips, like no over the top makeup or anything. But if we have a look at our grade, like that just looks fucked. It looks wrong. Her skin looks weird. You know, what have we done? Um, so what we can try and do is fix this because the skin looks a little green to me, especially in here. I mean, look at that green, green in there. So we can try and fix that using the tint slider, so pulling it towards magenta. And then we've got to be careful we don't tint our shadows and other important aspects. And maybe it needs a little more warmth. Like, this looks fucked. And really, like, you shouldn't have to pull a qualifier on someone's skin when it's lit so well with such a high-end camera. 
you know, usually this is user error. My skin looks crap here, it looks real bad. Um, we've tried to fix it using white balance. Now I'm going to jump straight for my primaries in my highlights because that's where most of the skin sits. And what's the opposite color of green? Magenta. looking slightly better and yes I do want this tan color to be prominent throughout however I just I think I am gonna have to pull a qualifier on this anyway um, I also while we're here I'm gonna try and fix these pink lips so I'm gonna go to hue versus hue and I'm gonna jump straight for these magenta -y reds you just click on this double click that make it zero and we just pull it down, pull it up. You'll notice I'm not actually selecting enough. So if we click on them, it should tell us where it is. Okay. We're not selecting enough of the reds either. Ah, we're not selecting enough of the magenta. Yeah, so when people complain about these curves, it's often user error. Um, the best way I find to do it is to do a crazy transformation first. So you get a range of color, crazy transformation, right? And then modify where the selection is taking place by sliding these around and looking at the image. So now we've got a pretty good key, much easier than actually just using a qualifier, or is it? And um, you'll notice that we are selecting other parts of the skin as well, and that's because there are magenta parts in that skin. It'd be awesome if you could see this as a key. Black magic. Anyway, so now we have the range. Um, we can just, you know, they sort of look, used to look, I mean, not that bad, but what we can do is just back these off into a more neutral color. I think that's looking better. Yeah. Cool. So let's have a look at what we're going for here. Do we need to pull a qualifier? No, we don't have time for it anyway. Um, the next job here is to actually give us, or create, or emphasize that teal color. And it's already there, as you can see. But let's just go ahead and grab this. And just add it even more. Should we rescue those highlights? Like, we don't really need to, do we? Um, but we can. Ah, I've got a mask there. Um, yeah, so when so all I did on the on the right here was just add that tealy color in. And just let's just watch the whole shot, make sure that's not affecting the color of our skin too much. Okay, things look pretty good. There's the original. There's our shot. Remember, that's not log. That's Rec 709 ish or Red Gamma 4. And then we've added you know a whole lot of saturation, a whole lot of contrast, and it's matching pretty well here. One thing we could pick on I guess is that the contrast level is a little lifted in this original shot like if you look at the true blacks in this shot they're not actually as black or crushed as this one so um, there's one cool way to fix that and and highlights as well it's like you add a final node and then you just grab your curve and you can just do this you can just instantly turn it to hipster just by like sliding this thing down um, but if you just do it a smidge, just like that, it just brings back that shadow range which is just more suited to our other grade. It also lowers our highlights, makes them a little milkier as well. I think that's also helping here. Now again, do we, you know, track her face, add sharpening? Uh, like, do you need to do that? I don't think so. Like, the shot's just beautiful as it is. The lighting's really nice as it is. We're just trying to complement what's already there. You could say that the skin could be balanced out a little bit more. But let's have a look and see what happens after some noise reduction anyway. 
because um, we probably don't need to. So, uh, final node here, and we're just going to go noise reduction, temporal, five frames, better, and we're going to look at a medium mo um, motion range. Because she, yeah, I would consider that a medium motion range. She's not jumping up and down. Uh, and then we're just going to start, we'll look at actual size. We just want to back off Luma a smidge, right? So it's cleaner. But the real um, thing I want to do is mess with the chroma. Like, see this green under here and there's all this chroma noise. It's not too bad. But I just want to see what happens if we smash that a little bit more. So let's unlink Luma and pull this chroma all the way over. I think that's helped a little bit. Yeah, it's definitely cleaned up those pinky greeny bits in here. And we could, you know, fix the neck there. I don't think we need to again. Anyway, so that noise reduction node's working a treat. Before and after. Do we need to add like a window and focus? Remember before I said, you know, here's the, the general thing most people do. All right, here's our focus. So we want to maybe darken everything there and then add an outside node and brighten everything here and sharpen that up like that's a typical workflow but I feel like she's already prominent and maybe this is an instance where instead of doing that we pay homage to the light source and we increase that and that's gonna help maybe the shot um, give it a bit more depth is it gonna be distracting will we want to look over there more so I don't think so. This is looking good. At least they're matching. They look like they're part of the same story. Yeah, I like that. All right, so I'm gonna save that, pop it in there. And, you know, just to make yourself feel good about how much time you just spent, um, it's fun to go in shift control shift F right make the uh, icons nice and big and then go and have a look at graded clips only and now you can actually see oh, does this story look like it's matching the thing that stands out to me and looks odd is the white watch faces so maybe we do need to add a bit of blue back into those um, we can do that later on maybe we can do it now but the point is that like this is a great place to see that and see where problems arise um, I mean, if you delivered it like this, I'm sure Devin would be happy. Um, but will you be happy as a colorist, knowing that you've let that slip? So there's a little bit of um, a catch-22 here. You go Control-Shift-F, you want to look at the graded shots, you go back, and then you're like, where the hell's my timeline? Well, you've just said, hey, only look at graded clips. And um, to change that, you click on this drop-down box and you can select all clips. All right. So, next shot. I think I want to go here and have a look out the front. And maybe match. Maybe again use this as a, a guide. And what I'm going to try and do, and this is probably um, illegal in terms of what the client wants. <laughs> but I don't like this purple. I want this purple to be closer to this blue. Alright. Um, so let's go ahead and have a look at maybe adding a bit more contrast to this shot. Although... I like the way the sky is sitting already. I'll just pull these shadows down. And the beauty of this shot is you don't have a skin tone to worry about. You don't have contrast ratio on a face to worry about. So you can sort of just decide where stuff goes. Let's go to my log mode, lower the lower range, and um, just balance out those shadows a smidge. I'm going to leave the sky the way it is. I think the white balance, even though it's a little cool, I think it's okay. Actually, I wonder. I just don't like this sort of purple color. Let's go here, go to the clip settings, and let's just cool it off, bring it towards blue a little bit more. Yeah. And let's take out magenta, so add a little bit of green. So now this road and that is like a bit closer. without you know, us having to pull keys and things like that. But what about this color contrast, this tan color? Well, we're looking for something in the frame that has that already, and that is the highlights, um, the reflection of the sun on these windows. So what I'm gonna actually do 
is just grab this and pop it here and see if DaVinci will track that perfectly first time around. Of course it will. And we go back and just track back. Oh yes, we're still recording. Um, and we're going to do another one. So we go back here, add another linear window. And we'll do it for this one as well. Just pull that corner in there. And we'll track that guy. And one more. Grab this guy here. And track that as well. Okay, so we've got this. Wait, what do we got? This. And we just check everything's cool, which it pretty much is. Now we can like um, add some extra contrast to the scene. That's better. All right. Subtle, but better. Then we can go ahead. Um, you can play with this. Increase color temp. Um, so we're just pushing it towards a warmer color temperature. That looks pretty good. Straight out of the box. And we're going to have a look here and just have a look at, you know, are these the colors we want? That looks pretty good. Get the primaries. Push them even more. Like, you know, it is a stylized grade. We are trying our best here. You got to be careful, though, that we don't tint the blacks too much. Um, so if we turn this on and off, you can see our blacks screwed. So there's a few things we could do. And our masks are, like, terrible. Let's soften that, bring it back in here. Didn't do a very good job. Because really we just want the window itself with the reflection. And we've got that here, we don't necessarily want that. Okay. It's looking much better. Um, but what I was going to say is there's sort of no way you can... Well, obviously there is a way. Um, but when you play with your white balance slider, push that towards warmth, and I went for my gain and my mids, push more yellow into it, um, undoubtedly you're going to tint your black. So one way to do it is go to your lift, because that's where your shadows live, right? And push blue into it and try and balance that out. Which will take away some of the orange, but, you know, it's still there. It's still there. And you can look at a lower range, like I keep going to log, going to, you know, low range of log, and just push it. But you can see what that's doing, right? Now you've got control over those shadows. Okay, I think that's looking pretty cool. Um, and now I'm going to do that dodgy trick that I just want to select everything but the window, so Alt-O. And just to see, um, you know, I want to match this teal-ish color instead. Let me go here, see if I can do it. If it's possible, I'll put some more effort into it. Yeah, so we've gone closer, like it'll never be the same because this is a highlight reflection and this is a piece of concrete that's in shadow. So it's never going to be the same, but the point is it's going to be closer. Uh, now what did I mean by do a better job? Well, maybe I don't want to select the sky. So here we have the outside of the windows that I've selected and changed, right? But I also want to make sure that I don't select this sky. So in order to do this, how do we do this? Yeah, just invert the key that I just pulled. Um, have a look at some higher range and some lower saturation. Why hasn't it selected this area? Ah, it's just an ultra saturated. No? What the fuck? That's so weird. If that's off, and that's off. I have no idea why I can't select that. That pisses me off. Let's just try again on a separate node. See, what the fuck? I should be able to... Yeah, see, there we go. Why can't I do that? Here. Yeah. That is dodgy. 
I'm gonna say the computer. I'm gonna say this piece of software sucks. Anyway, let's pretend we could select there, which we should be able to. Um, so now I'm not ch changing the sky. That's my point there. Why am I choosing gamma over gain? I don't know. I'm just seeing which one works better. I mean, we know the concept behind which what each one does. That doesn't always work. Let's just fix the shadows. Still looks average. Um, maybe I want to add some focus to this Jack Mason thing because it is a bit of a wide shot that needs a bit of attention. And I also don't like this green. I'm going to try and get rid of that as well. Neutralize it. And maybe let's just punch up these windows even more. Yeah, it looks better. Um, what was I saying? So, yeah, let's just try and bring out this Jack Mason logo a little bit more. Uh, so we should be able to track this with ease, as we saw a second ago. Uh, turn our grade off so it just tracks better. There's enough contrast there. It tracks quicker, sorry. Okay, so now we've got that. We can turn our grade back on. And maybe, you know... Just bring this out a bit. Yeah. Doesn't look like I put a power window there, does it? Who knows? We'll see in the final edit. I mean, my eye goes straight there. So that seems to be working okay. Uh, this looks a bit ugly. Sort of like green shadows here. Oh, do we pull another window on there? I just, uh, yeah, right. Let's do it in. Um, let's do it in. In line with that guy. Put this in. Mm -hmm. Like seriously, I reckon most colorists just wouldn't even bother doing this stuff. I just can't help it. Um, so my goal here is just to de-green it somewhat. If I just go here and go here, yeah. So I'm just desaturating the door based on saturation levels. I think that looks better. And then finally, I want to try and get rid of this green grass. So I'm going to put a node right here towards the start after our contrast thingy. Um, you know, we could do hue versus hue. Might be the easiest way to do this. And just grab everything that's remotely green. And just push it and see what happens. And so you just want to be careful that you're doing the right thing. In other words, you don't want to be changing this and this and this. So I think if we did this, yeah, that's where we've got to be careful. Um, so what's the goal? Do you want to change the hue of the grass, or do you want to actually just desaturate the grass? What is the goal, Matt? <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe it looks weird if everything's the same blue color. 
Maybe I just want to make it more of a yellow. Yeah. I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to do a similar curve. And that. Yeah, it just takes that fluoroness off it. And you can see my dodgy key here, but that's not my fault, that's Resolve being a dick. Um, <laughs> that's looking pretty good. I'm gonna right click and save that. And let's just Shift F and see if we feel good about ourselves. Go to Great Eclipse. They're matching, things are working out. We've got a, we've got a, a teal orange look going on here. I think, you know, you can always revisit. Fix that sky, blah, 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 blah. Maybe, anyway, but I think that works. And that's the key. Does it work as a whole? The whole point of this series is not to teach you how to grade a shot. Because how to grade a shot, that's easy. But grading a piece, grading a film, that is what separates the men from the boys. Can you match shots together? Do you have a goal? Do you know what you're doing? Or do you just know how to use some cool tricks and resolve and make a shot look good? Look at that key. Imagine I left that the way it was. Mm. All right, cool. So um, we're lazy, remember? Oh, clips. So we're just gonna middle click and just see what happens. It looks terrible. Bad idea. Um, but maybe we just cr we um, we just grab this node here, copy and paste. Right? Because that way we're going to match the color of the building pretty much, or much quicker, uh, without having to mess around with it. And let's just get rid of our key here. Uh, maybe just say no. I don't want a key at all. No, ah, that's it. Okay, so that's happened. Um, let's just put a node before that and quickly draw a mask around this window here. And it's Parts like this where you'll just be like, oh, I think I've had enough, I'm tuning out. I'm gonna go and watch another video. Because you've already seen me do it. And that was a risk I took when making this video. Of course it's gonna be boring, and most people aren't gonna watch this far. Um, let's bring up our previous shot. And let's match the shit out of this. <laughs> do you have to make sure it matches exactly? No. Like, you know, if we look at this on the vector scope, uh, waveform monitor, and do we match it exactly with this one? Like, I don't think that's important. What's important is, do they cut well? Do they flow? Does it look right for the shot? I think that was my problem. Don't use this temp slider because it messes with the shadows as well. Mm, the so will gain. It's basically the same thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to get roughly that warm look, but then you can see like obvious issues. But we know how to fix those issues, right? Because we're professionals. So what's the goal? The goal is to get the highlights on the window to be orange and look like they're reflecting a sunset. Okay. So we've drawn a mask, but the mask encumbers more than that. So how do you tell the mask to select less? Did we track that? Yeah, we did. Well, what you do is you put a qualifier inside the mask as well, and you say, hey, don't look at these darker areas, bro. Just look at the highlights. So kill, oh, sorry, keep the highlights, kill the dark. Check it out. So now we've got this sick key. Should have done that in the other ones. Yeah, and that's looking better. Looking much better. And now we can just be a bit more liberal with it and just push this around. All right, cool. And while we're here, let's just bring out the logo a bit more. See, aren't you glad you stuck around for that? What a great little section that was. You were gonna quit. Okay, and let's just track this. Turn your grade off. If it's a high contrast scene with good focus, it'll just track way quicker and it should track just fine. Turn the grade back on. And let's just bring this out a little bit. Yeah. Okay. 
Now they don't match. Something we didn't really check the whole time. <laughs> but the cool part is we can just sort of fix that um, now. So um, here we go here. Maybe it would be better to match this to um, match this to this instead. Um, but we're not gonna. So I'm gonna match this one here. So the main thing was the exposure levels much better on this close up. So we're gonna drop that off just so they match better. Something like that, and then this. Um, tint that we've got going is a bit blue, it needs to be more something. There we go. Alright, cool. So these shots match, the windows look cool. We've got a sick looking grey. And maybe this is um, a time um, for the old lazy, hey, just don't look over here. So you just grab this thing, get your curve, pull it down. So all I'm doing is just darkening parts of the frame. And what this does, like, why do we do this? Uh, a couple of reasons. We're trying to get the viewer to look somewhere, and they look at the brightest part of the image. But it also gives it a shot depth. A particularly flat shot gives it a bit more depth. looks more 3D. And another trick you can do, um, so we can have a look at the key. So this is what we're actually darkening. And I love this soft gradient. I love what this is doing to the shot, because you can't notice it. But I don't love that it's darkening my Jack Mason brand. Um, so same thing we did with the windows, just pull a key inside that mask, only looking at luminance, right? And just say, keep everything that's bright, kill everything that's darker. And that's exactly what we've just done there. Um, wait, what? Other way around? Other way around. There we go. So don't include the Jack Mason logo, is what we're trying to say. There we go. Cool. That looks sweet. I'm feeling good about this grade. You know what? Feeling good. I'm postponing lunch. Probably a bit much on this. Whenever something's a bit much, instead of going back and trying to reduce your curve, just go to the key. And just back the key off, smidge. There we go. Cool. All right, let's move on. All right, so uh, the next shot I want to have a look at is this shot here. Seemingly, right, if you at a glance, you'd be like, "Fuck yeah, easy to grade, nice skin tones, beautiful soft light." But this is a really challenging shot to grade, um, and you'll see why in a second. And the biggest challenge of it is, whenever you have issues with skin tones. Um, and we had a small issue here with skin tones, but it wasn't too bad. And now that I look at this shot, it looks way too warm. Anyway, the point is um, everything matches nicely. <laughs> and we can always apply a blanket grade to the entire thing at the end. But I did struggle with this shot. Um, I had a quick play with it when um, Devin sent it through. And it's because I tried to grade it from here, right? Um, you know, add a little bit more contrast. And then I was like, fuck, but the skin just looks fucked. So then I'm gonna, you know, try and select the skin and like get all the skin that we can. You know, and then we're gonna start selecting the paper and we're gonna clean it up. And then like, what, what color do I make the skin? Like, how do you do it? Like, yeah, there's so many techniques you can do. The thing is though, the reason why I struggle so much with it is because the white balance was just wrong to begin with. And there's a giveaway here. See this bench top? This is supposed to be brown wood. Right? See this white paper, this is supposed to be white. And if you look at it long enough, if you look at it long enough, um, it will look white to you. Your brain will tell you it's white. But if you look here, it's definitely not white. I and mean, look at this. So the the best thing to do if you've got raw is to correct white balance first. It's honestly, once you've got your exposure and things like that. Let's go to clip. Let's go to the white balance. Right? Now by default it's lower than fifty six hundred Kelvin. Pretty sure this was shot with um, a Joker and another HMI plus a bit of window light. And you know what? They're all 5600 Kelvin. Potentially the window light was even warmer. So um, this right balance is kind of wrong, right? Um, it's definitely wrong. So how do we fix that? First of all, we're going to look at this scope. We're going to look at this bit of paper. And all we're going to do is try and make that bit of paper white. So let's go to the color temp, increase. 
and check it out. Paper's gradually going white. And you might be thinking, fuck, 10,000 Kelvin, that's crazy. And you know what, it is. And it's actually not enough to completely balance this white bit of paper. So that just goes to show the sort of color temperature setting that we're in. But the point is, now that we've done that, this shot's easy to grade. I don't have to pull a skin qualifier. The keyboard's white, the paper's white enough. You know, and so what I learned from that was, I wanted to pass it on to you, is that white balance is so important, so important. Because once the white balance is correct, everything else is just a breeze. Um, so yeah, now, this shot is just gonna work so much easier. We can add our, um, our blue to the scene, or we could keep it, you know, we can select the skin and make it this color if we want. Uh, let's go and have a look at our other skin tone um, as an example. So you can see the skin's definitely too warm. It's got a lot of red in it. But the point is, our whole scene's balanced now, so we can back that off. We can mess with that much easier. Um, so I'm gonna try and do that on a separate node with a hue versus hue, and just quickly mess around with it. Remember, like I said before, you sort of just wanna, this is how I do it. You basically push it into a weird color. And uh, now what we're gonna do is grab this. And should all skin tones be identical? No, but I just want them to fall a little bit closer to each other. Because if you look at this, I mean, they're definitely very different ones looks very red, it even just looks red to your eye, so um, the goal here is to uh, pull the red channel down a smidge towards green. It's so touchy this curve, but it's still useful, as you can see. All right, so that skin difference before, after, before, after. I think it definitely looks better. It definitely starts to match everything a lot more. Oh yeah, look at that. It's fucking sick. <laughs> and um, you know what? We could desaturate it some to match this one more, but this is where you have to be careful as well when matching. So it's like, where does this clip lie? What's the shot before it? What's the shot after it? The shot before it is not her. The shot before it is not this watch. So, it w the goal would not be to match these perfectly because right now they look pretty damn good next to each other. The problem is the goal before the shot before it is this shot, and right now they do not look like they match. The shot after it is this shot, and you know what? They're not too bad. We need to fix some exposure and things like that here. But yeah, that's just another sort of tip when matching shots and jumping all around the timeline like I am, it's tempting to just grab your hero shot and just be like, fuck yeah, I'm nailing this, look how good that looks. But it doesn't really, it's not important at this stage um, to match these perfectly, it's important to make sure that these shots follow each other nicely. So anyway, um, there's our before and after, make, you know, remembering that our color temperature was a crazy 10,000. Next thing we could do is add a, another node here and start maybe cooling the shadows off just a smidge, and that might help us get back into this ballpark. Um, there's a thousand ways to do that. We could just go straight for our primaries, um, go to our lift or gamma. I'd probably recommend going to gamma and just pulling that down ever so slightly. Check it out. Still got that nice skin tone, but now you can see our wood and our shadows have sort of cooled off a little bit. Before, after, before, after. Things just cooled down, neutralized a little bit. I think that's looking pretty good. Considering how long this shot goes for, one and a half, one, two, one, not even two seconds. How important is it to spend much more time on this? What's the goal of this shot? The goal is for us to look at what he's drawing. Maybe notice the wristband here as well. And it's pretty easy to do that, I think. I mean, it's already sort of happening just with focus and composition. But I wonder if we back this off a little bit. Just a smidge, just to help have the, give the shot a bit more depth. Right? Maybe blur it a smidge as well. Then we could maybe uh, sharpen this up. Maybe add some mid-tone detail using the mid-tone detail slider. Let's see what that looks like. It's, I mean, it's easy enough to track, why not try it? 
And we're also losing a bit of detail. You look at the original. I wonder if we can rescue some of that. That's looking better. I'm just pulling the mids down. And already, like, there's more focus here. It's great. We don't even need to sharpen it. There's enough sharpness there. Potentially, um, potentially, let's go to these. Um, potentially, we could go mid-tone detail and increase. Uh, and that's going to help sort of make us, force us to look there. Probably looks a little bit overdone. Um, one way to hide that is to make this bigger and softer. Nah, it's not going to work either. Let's just try this. And remember the old trick, go to the key and just back it off. There we go. Sweet. Do we try and incorporate a bit of teal in this? Fuck yeah, why not? Let's add another node. Let's grab the lazy and throw the lazy down here. And maybe just put our teal there. Is it a bit of a wank to do that? It is, but we're just trying to be true to our, our original goal here. I think that's gonna work, right? <laughs> we could even do it to this one. No, 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 that's bad. Yeah, it's all right. Shot done? Yeah, shot done. <laughs> all right, let's have a look. See, this things are looking pretty sweet. We're a colorist. We're doing this professionally. <laughs> all right. I am going to wrap this up because um, I'm not going to do the entire thing. But hopefully you've got a lot out of this already or at least you've just procrastinated for the day and it's been fun. Um, you know, there's a few shots that I really did want to mess with. I just honestly don't have time and I don't want this to go for four hours. This one, yeah, okay, this one's worth doing. So um, the reason this one's worth doing is because it's slightly different what I'm going to do to it. Um, so my goal was, you know, I'm looking at this shot. What's distracting about the shot? What's important about the shot? What's important about the shot is what she's doing, right? So what is she doing? She's drawing. She's cutting stuff. And your eye instantly goes for that already because there's movement. That's the only source of movement in the frame. Um, and these are also important. The wristbands, the watches, obviously. What pisses me off a little bit, doesn't piss me off, but distracting is maybe the pink flower. We could try and back that off a little bit. But what I thought might be fun to do is just emphasize these shafts of light coming in. Um, so first of all, we want to match color-wise and bring up exposure. I'm just, I'm a curves guy. Like I said, I always use curves to mess with the image. I just prefer using curves over the primaries. One, because I'm a mouse guy as well. Just got to be careful of those bits of paper there. You can always add a mask to your curves, right? And just say, hey, ignore this when you make that adjustment, bro. Right? And just soften the shit out of it. Ugh. Two, 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 two. And um, then go to that and then invert it. I probably should have just used a um, circle thingy. Um, and then what you could do is add an outside node to that, and then you've sort of got specific control over those bits of paper. But who's going to go to this much effort, right? It's crazy. Anyway, so what I wanted to do is um, mess with this volumetric light potential that's coming through here. And to do that, I'm going to add another node, grab this window thingy. And maybe this is going to work. All right, and let's just punch it up a bit. And let's add another one. So what I'm going to do is go edit, copy window, create another linear, and then go edit, paste window. And then just drag that down. Saved a bit of time, didn't it? Let's have a look at what we're doing here. Yeah, and now that we've got these shafts coming in, shaft, <laughs> um, we can mess with them. Like this, maybe. And the thing with light is, you want it to fall off nicely. Yeah, and now we can invert that 
Um, so Alt O, and we can back off everything outside of it, bring up everything inside of it, and check out what it does. Um, just in terms, and I'm going to highlight both of those clips um, nodes and create a compound node so I can turn it on and off. Look what it does. It sort of adds a bit more life to the shot, adds a bit more volume to the shot, makes it look more 3D. Does it? I reckon it does. Yeah, I thought that one might be a cool one to play with. Um, so now I've got my overall um, balance of the shot. Um, and what I want to do is basically color correct it to match this tealy murky green look that we've got going here. Um, so, how do we do that? Well, I'd be focusing on the leather straps first, slash the skin. Remembering that we have before and after shots that are also important. Okay, so it's very warm, but it does look better. It does suit the whole scene a bit more. And then what about our tealness? Maybe we just emphasize that a little bit more in her um, top, because I've actually yellowed it, which looks gross. So maybe when I've created this correction, right? I mean, this is just me trying this. I don't even know if it's gonna work. Uh, maybe, uh, um, I select everything blue first. So let's try that. I'm going to select blue. Shift H. And let's mess with this a little bit. This is going to be dancing. It's going to be dancing. I should be doing this before anyway. Such a cop out. Let's just see if um, that helped. It should do. Um, <laughs> we can add an outside node there. And you know, we can match this shit up pretty good. Okay. I'm just going to add a final node here. So I've done this dodgy fucking shit color correction. <laughs> um, oh, it just looks bad. It's because I've selected the whites and the blues. Anyway, um, and what I was going to do is correct the blacks. So a quick way to do that. Uh, that looked alright actually is just to grow, add a node at the very end, go to your log, and then mess with the low range. I didn't really explain this before, but the low range, this 0 0.409 refers to 409 on here. So if you were to set this to um, 0.256-ish, basically everything under that line is now going to be affected. All right, see that? How cool is that? It's like a, it's almost like a key. It's really cool. Um, and this is useful, especially in the super low range. So I'm going to put this down all the way down to like 139, even lower. And that way you can just mess with these bits right down here, real easy. So it's a great way to clean up blacks instead of using primaries. And it's also a great way to add contrast down there as well. Anyway, yeah, you can see what I've done there. So there's before, there's after, there's before, there's after. And that's just something that's really impossible to do with primaries, difficult to do with curves, easy to do with log mode. Um, not really happy with this, but like I said, I'm running out of time. This is going way too long already. Um, you get the idea. Ugh, it's so hard to just accept that. <laughs> but anyway, um, the cool thing is that Devon has uh, allowed us and got permission to share some of these clips with you. 
So um, you'll be able to go to unsubscribed those mother. <laughs> um, you'll be able to go to my blog and download this shit. So downloads, download that shit. Remember, download um, that shit and grade your shit. Has nothing to do with the quality of material. It's just a slang sort of word that I like to use. Um, yeah, but there'll be some extra clips here coming up, and they will be referred to this project. So you'll be able to work on those uh, with me. I'm definitely going to supply this clip, and potentially one of the watch shots as well. Um, yeah, so so much you can do with this shot, um, but do you want to match it to the rest of your timeline? That's the important key takeaway from Grade My Shit. Hopefully you've learned some shit and um, enjoyed this little this massive long-winded tutorial thingy. But um, yeah, I'm gonna be hopefully doing these one a month. I've got another one, a music video, which is really cool. And I'm gonna get better at actually recording myself uh, with a camera and recording the interviews as well, because I totally screwed them up. It's my first time doing this sort of thing. Um, so like actually recording it. But yeah, um, I'll be back. See you next month. Thanks for tuning in. Peace.